and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker. And today we have uh, an extra special treat for you guys. I I'm uh, continuing on with my Shroud Wars debates uh, shows. And I'm actually joined by three special guests uh, today. So I'm really excited about this. So in the first place, uh, we have the uh, famous Shroud skeptic. He's been on our show before, Hugh Ferry. Welcome to the show, Hugh. Hi, Dan. And uh, joining him on the pro show side, someone who's new to the show, and I, I'm really excited to have him on board. He was very influential in, in my own knowledge of the Shroud, is the pro Shroud expert, Mark Antinacci. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hi, thanks for having me. Excellent. And we're not done yet, because we actually have a third uh, guest, Teddy Pappas from Skeptics and Seekers. Hey, Teddy. Hi, how are, we, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, so perfect. Yeah, we're going to be continuing on with the Shroud Wars debates and the plan of action for today. So the way it's going to work, we have three very three topics, major topic sections. So the first is going to be obviously the dating of the Shroud, um, and uh, so we're going to give you know ten minute opening speeches for for both Mark and for Q Ferry to give their take. Then we're going to have the the informal dialogue between them. Uh, but the thing that's going to be new is that I'm going to have Teddy come in after they have their exchange and do sort of a cross-examination of both sides. So she'll be able to probe them, uh, ask clarifying questions, ask questions about things that they didn't uh, even mention and, and get their take on that. So uh, that's what we're going to do on the, the three topics uh, after the dating. It's going to be the same thing with, okay, well, what, what are the image features that are important for image formation? Uh, and then finally, we're going to have our third section on the topic of what are, what is the image formation mechanism, and we're going to get their takes on that. So yeah, that's the the plan for action. Uh, but before we get into that, I think it's a, uh, important to get familiar with our guests. Um, so in the first place, Hugh, my audience will definitely be familiar with you. Um, so maybe if you want to give us some updates, and also just to prove that you're not uh, an evil atheist in disguise. Uh, I'm curious, what, why are you a Christian? Are, are you persuaded by other evidence, like the, the resurrection of Jesus, or is it the inner witness of the Holy Spirit? What, why are you, why do you believe Christianity is true? Well, I mean, I, essentially I was born into it, so I've been a Christian, I've been a Catholic all my life, and I went to school in a Catholic uh, school. I, I, my secondary school was a monastery, so uh, I got very familiar with all the tenets of the Christian and specifically Catholic version of Christianity, um, and it seems to me convincing. Do you, do you think there's any like you know you know Gary Habermas has sort of the minimal facts for the resurrection? Do you, do you find anything like that convincing on your end or? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah quite, quite a lot of it seems to me um, quite important. I, I did uh, last year. I did a. Um, a diploma in what it was, a postgraduate certificate in shroud studies um, from the from the Regina Apostolorum University in Rome. And one of the uh, papers I had to write for that uh, was about the, 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 the resurrection and the, whether it was likely or not, and what it meant, and, and whether there was evidence for it. Very much came down to their being. Perfect. Uh, okay. And, uh, and any updates since you've been on the show last in terms of shroud research that you'd like to, to mention to people briefly? Um, no, not really. I've carried on uh, about with stains and dyes. Um, some satisfaction that I'm quite pleased with. Them. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the to the brand new guest. And uh, so this is to you, Mark. Uh, do you want to maybe just give us an introduction as to, to who you are? And, you know, what is your involvement with the Shroud? Um, I'm an attorney. Um, I was an agnostic before I stumbled across the subject by accident. Um, and and I, that's a good background um, to stumble onto this subject because uh, no matter what, I mean, if you're, if you're a member of a different religion or, or, or a hardcore atheist or something, you've got a lot of... Um, I don't know, baggage or, or thinking or, or um, philosophy or whatever that you have to overcome or something. But if you're agnostic, hey, hey, you don't know. You don't know one way or the other. 
And so it wasn't as, as difficult. I was raised in a uh, Protestant background. And, um, and so I just, um, I'm in my early 30s when I come across the shroud almost 40 years ago. And um, so I just, I just reverted back to my, uh, and where I'm still at, my Protestant uh, background. Um, I started working um, with some of the STIRP scientists. I, I really, the first three years of my research was just um, reading over uh, all the scientific journals. And uh, of course, there's a couple horn books. Gary Habermas's horn book with Ken, Ken Stevenson was a huge influence. And, and it caused me to, to do a double take and start researching the shroud. But um, I got to know uh, some of the STIRP scientists very well, in particular, John Jackson. And um, I became quite familiar with his cloth collapse hypothesis. I, I had a role in helping him develop it on the, on the, on the fringes. I, I financed uh, some of it. After a while, you got to be making some uh, substantive contributions and, and really learned it well. And, and that was a big advantage. Uh, a huge advantage. Uh, uh, we worked together, oh, I don't know, seven, eight years. I was best man at uh, his wedding in 92. And uh, I I kind of always went at the hardcore scientific and medical evidence. Um, I, I also, you know, uh, uh, wrote two books on the subject. They're very comprehensive. I include the archaeological and the historical evidence but to me, the scientific evidence is, is much more dispositive. Um, so that's, uh, in a uh, hundred words or less, um, my introduction. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's, like I said, it's great to, to have you on. I, I think that you're one of the best pro shroud proponents, and Hugh is one of the best, uh, if not the best, uh, shroud skeptic. But it's going to be an even match here today for sure. Um, but we actually have our third guest, as I mentioned, uh, Teddy, you're, you might be new to some of those in our audience uh, that don't come from s and so do you mind giving us an introduction as to who you are and, and involved in the Shroud? Sure. I uh, first became aware of the Shroud when I was around 16 or 17 years old. It was around Easter time when there was something mentioned on television and then I think I saw something on a magazine cover and uh, it intrigued me and I went to a bookstore and uh, bought Dr. Habermas's book on Verdict on the Shroud and uh, ever since that time have uh, been very fascinated by the Shroud and uh, I'm, I'm a criminal defense attorney uh, so you know, sometimes that comes in handy in terms of researching. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I had a couple of chemistry classes in, in college, so that helps a little bit with reading uh, some of these scientific articles, although science is not really uh, my area of expertise, but, you know, I try to trudge through it. Excellent. Yeah, well, it's great to have you on board as well. I know we've had a lot of interaction on the SNS site and everything. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a good time. Um, so with that said, let, let's get straight into the, the actual topics uh, of debate here. So the first issue is obviously on the dating. And I know that uh, we covered a lot on the, the carbon-14 and that. So I was kind of hoping that we can also discuss some of the other evidences that are indications of the, the age of the shroud. Um, so yeah, on that front, I flipped the coin and Hugh Ferry uh, won. So you get to give the opening statement for the dating issue and Mark will have the last word on this section. So uh, yeah, Hugh, I'll give you the opening statement. Okay, number one, no record of a double imaged shroud or indeed any imaged shroud for 35th. Number two, the width of the shroud requires a Four shaft boom, which wasn't invented for about 1200. Three, the shroud fits in very nicely uh, with the quem queritis experiment. I, I, I'm having trouble hearing uh, number two and number three. Okay, uh, number two is the weave on the loom. 
which I don't think was invented before 1200. Uh, number three is the shroud fits the Quen Quirinus ceremony, the middle, uh, the Easter Easter ceremony in the Middle Ages. Number four, the dribbling of blood reflects the blood cults of the late Middle Ages. And number five, guess what? The radiocarbon, and that's it. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll just turn it over to, to Mark then. You get 10 minutes or less to get your opening so the meeting of the shroud. Um, the, um, there's all kinds of questions you could raise about the radiocarbon dating. However, only one explanation could account for a 1200 year difference way over in, in the, almost the farthest point away from the body. And, and the closest point to that body is some of the thinnest parts of the body. It's around the uh, ankles. And it's probably one of the farthest points away from the bulk of the body. The, the reason that, well, the only thing that could explain it is neutrons or neutron radiation. And the reason that's the case is all the other methods like contamination or whatever, if, it, if, if uh, say some, some sort of uh, material uh, was on the shroud that didn't get eliminated, that material not only has carbon-14, but it has a million times more carbon-12 in it. But a neutron flux only replaces the numerator the carbon-14. It doesn't do anything else. And so you get these huge increases in the numerator. Well, you only have to increase them maybe 16 to 18%. And um, I've tried to devise with Bob Rucker and other scientists, uh, Tom McAvoy's helping us, Hugh, Hugh met him at the uh, conference. And um, you could devise a series of tests and experiments uh, to prove whether the shroud has been irradiated with neutrons and how many additional carbon-14 atoms would be created at each location, but it's much bigger than that. You could prove whether the body was the source of that radiation. And if that's the case, you're gonna get a different amount of radiation at every, you know, centimeter on the cloth, every inch of it. And it's going to be in correlation to that part of the cloth's closeness to the to the not only the body, but the bulkier parts of the body. And it would kind of cut through all this uh, uh, on the one hand this and on the other hand that we don't have a solid historical record and everything like that, because you could not only determine the amount of radiation and the source of radiation, you could calculate the real age of every sample. Um, you'd know how much additional carbon-14 was created like that because carbon-14 is created from neutrons at a known rate and it disappears at a known rate. And with that uh, foundation, if you will, there's formulas for determining when the event occurred. And if you took samples from, say, the tomb of Christ, and I'm kind of simplifying everything, if that is the real tomb, you'd find these, these radioactive atoms in the limestone structure, if there's any left, and that would tell you where the event occurred, and that would also tell you when the event occurred. And um, if, you can, if you've got a miraculous radiating event, from which the total evidence is also consistent with uh, uh, time and location and, and uh, uh, executioners and uh, barriers and things like that, you wouldn't have any problem identifying who the person was because you would have billions of items of, of radioactive atoms as a basis for, for these uh, tests. And, and, and uh, I, I won't go on too long, but 
you could you could take these tests on materials that are extremely plentiful on both the shroud, the sidarium, and if the tomb of Christ is, is really extant uh, and there's limestone structure or a slab there, uh, you would just take a tiny, tiniest fraction of these very plentiful materials, whether you're using charred material that are in 42 vials, and really all you need is a, a couple of ashes. And um, you, you would have, if, if the sides seam, the sewing threads along that, the about 13 feet of one of the, the uh, lines, one of the sides of the shroud, you would just need a couple of loops. Um, you, you're, you're, we're, we're talking about very plentiful materials here. Obviously, the shroud is over 14 feet long and three and a half feet wide and things like that. And there's 150 or more blood marks. You could take just a dot of blood um, and, and, and find billions of these items. Blood is very chemically rich and things like that. Um, the, the linen uh, would have uh, three of these radioactive uh, atoms in it, we think, because it was red um, in in the ancient times, and it would be more probably be more calcium and chlorine rich. That's kind of like an overview of um, of my point of view. But you can get some dispositive testing here um, on the shroud, and that's that's what I'm arguing for. Okay, and did and um, did you have anything on, as well in your statement about? other historical indications, like evidence from art history that you guys wanted to talk about, or the Sudarium, or? Well, I mean, there's, 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 um, I don't know, probably 20 some pictures in my, in my two books that are consistent with the, um, the shroud image as it looks on the negative. Um, there's, there's a number of coins now from, from the Byzantine era, um, you you have a, a, a uh, there's a lot of evidence from the historical and archaeological point of view that are consistent with this, but it's not like it's dispositive and you're going to have billions of of unforgeable items of evidence like you would with uh, radioactive atoms. Okay, all right, cool. Well, I think uh, now that the opening statements are out of the way, um, we can spend some time with a little bit of back and forth, an informal discussion. I'll. I'll trust both Mark and you to be professional enough not to interrupt each other and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, yeah, um, Hugh, uh, why don't we uh, start with you? What, what did you make of, what do you want to discuss with Mark based on his opening speech? Well, yes, I, I've, I've always agreed with uh, Mark and Bob Rucker that if the shroud was tested um, in other parts of the shroud and if it was found to be um, apparently much more recent than um, it appears to be, in particular, um, the, the middle of the body should date about 2,000 years into the future, as it were, or, or radioactivity, then his point should be made. But I don't like that the reason, I, I hear myself echoing, that's why I'm going to say yeah, that, it's something it's something with your connection. I don't know what, what it is, but it, it's definitely on your end. I can, hear, I can hear Mark beautifully, and I can hear you now. One reason for the shroud appearing medieval is that it is medieval. That's That would be my response. All I was going to say was that the reason the radio carbon is medieval is because the shroud is medieval. That's it. That, that's a real possibility. <laughs> okay. Mark, did you have anything that you wanted to, to discuss with, with Hugh based on his five reasons apart from the carbon? Or? Um, well, one of, his, um, one of his replies was that uh, if you took a piece of cloth from the body um, around the chest area, it would date a couple thousand years into the future. And, and according to the, um, I think they're called Monte Carlo neutron particle codes that uh, Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory developed and that uh, Bob Rucker applied uh, to the shroud. Um, 
that's what it indicates. Um, if you, uh, and these codes could be adjusted to uh, like calcium 41 to 40, uh, just like they're presently uh, adjusted to carbon 14 to carbon 12. They could also include uh, chlorine 36 to chlorine 35. But um, if you took a blood sample and just about all the blood samples are on the body. There are a couple that's off the body. But if you took a blood sample from the body, that would date something like 50 to 100,000 or more years into the future. Just utterly impossible. And um, when you get a wrong date, it's, it's rarely toward the future. If it is, it's just, you know, a couple of decades or something. But if you try to date something thousands or tens of thousands of years in the future, only neutrons could explain that. If, if you took a, a piece of material and you just say, just saturated it with, with uh, 2020 coffee and somehow it, the coffee consumes the entire uh, piece of material, it still won't date beyond 2020. Um, but if you get something dating to a future, only an excess of the numerator in the C14 to C12 equation can explain something like that. Um, you, you could learn a lot by testing the shroud uh, at the atomic level. And um, if, if um, I'm just adding on to, to what Hugh said, but um, I'm, I'm instead of trying to just debate a lot of things that you could you could interpret one way or the other, I'm like I'm trying to propose some dispositive tests that everyone could could agree upon and and it could decide the issue. Hugh may be right on the nose and it might be medieval. But these kinds of uh, testing would would tell you the, the one thing that the radiocarbon labs did not do, they punted and they had they had a lot of evidence indicating there was something systematic going on with that small sample less than than five centimeters long and and it's aging uh, 30 some years per centimeter and and it and it increases as you go up up the side uh, even ever so slightly and and hedges admits in his reply to Thomas Phillips, um, that yes, um, neutrons could invalidate the date, and and yes, uh, neutrons would would make a date uh, 1,200 years farther into the future. But we're going to punt for the. I can't describe it in justice. Uh, it's it's like a cop out, uh, uh, but we don't have a. Um, we don't know what the physical mechanism for neutrons being released during during the uh, during the resurrection. Therefore, we can't even test it. And and it was a real cop out because listen, the the issue was did neutrons hit the shroud? And they punted on this philosophical question. Um, neutrons were discovered in 1932. This was 1988. Somebody plausibly, he, Hedges says, there was no plausible physical mechanism for how the neutrons could have been released. Well, somebody could have, could have irradiated the shroud with neutrons between 1932 and 1988. You didn't need a big explanation of the resurrection and how neutrons were released during the resurrection. It was a real cop-out. And, and the awful thing they did was they took eight major dates from Arizona and they eliminated them and they averaged four sets of dates, four pairs of dates into an average. Those are manufactured artificial dates. And they eliminated the three worst or youngest dates, which was their outliers. But when they water them down, then, then you eliminate the outliers and you could squeeze it into a 95% certainty. 
within a 130 year plus or minus range. This is, this is replacing measured dates with unmeasured artificial dates just to achieve an objective. This is not, this is not professional. And um, this should never have been done. And they were supposed to, to share the raw data with the Institute of Meteorology in Italy. They never did that. They never even told them about eliminating the dates. And, and they never put it in the official report. It, this is very deceptive. It's forcing a medieval age range. And there's nothing wrong with the science. It's the scientist. They're ignoring indications that you've got an extraneous influence and it's even present on a sample less than five centimeters long. That's, that's what, I, what I fault them for. Yeah, and, and Hugh, I, I know that you're aware of some of the, the issues that Mark yeah. mentions. Did you wanna come back on that? And, and also, um, if, you, if you have any of the points that you mentioned that you'd like to get Mark to respond to those specific ones, feel free to bring that up as well. Yeah, well, I've got two points, really. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, suppose, just Mark, I completely ignore the Arizona results. I'm going to say they're all wrong, and I'm going to take them into account. Then we'll find that the other two results are quite sufficient to date the shroud for the Middle East. The reason Arizona's dates were, were not wrong, and they never questioned the accuracy of the dates, and there's no reason to think that it's wrong. I mean, they had eight major dates. They didn't miss it eight times. Um, that equipment is, 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 very, is very good. Um, and no one claimed that. But if you, the, this, the disparity between Arizona and Oxford, Oxford's uh, sample is the farthest away on, on one end and Arizona's is on the other. Well, it, it's the discrepancy. If you look at those dates from Arizona, the actual major dates, and you look at the dates from Oxford, and you look at the plus minus range, which they assign to it, you have close to 400 years. And even when they manipulated the evidence, you still have a 200 year range. But a 400 year range, they couldn't squeeze, they had, to, they had to monkey with that. They had to mess with it and alter eight dates from Arizona. And they did, they turned them into four dates. They essentially just averaged them. And, and cut in half the plus and minus ranges too in, in, in a lot of instances. But this is, this is not following the data. This is ignoring and replacing the data with, it's not even data, it's not measured dates. They're just throwing out, they're, they're just averaging them. It's like say a guy, it's like saying, uh, I don't know. It's, it's like saying Ted Williams never hit 406 in 1941. Uh, we're going to average in a spring training day, day, uh, eight, eight. And it has nothing to do with the measurements. It's, it's artificial. It's manufactured. And they did it in Hedge's own words to really avoid having to deal with these well-known principles of neutron absorption, not uh, neutron capture and, and the effects of that. Um, they punted deliberately, and, and, and the leaks come out of Arizona, and now it's not Donahue's fault. Donahue's a real nice guy and should never have been so accommodating, and he lets Gove go to, to Arizona and be there when it's present, when the dates come, and um, I'm not saying go, Gove or Sox might have been the leak, but anyway, they throw a bunch of leaks out and forces uh, a public announcement in October by Turin. Um, they had plenty of time to consult and talk a and look at their conduct the whole nine years, what they did. I mean, it started off when Gove called Sterp in 1979 in the hopes that he would get a sample to, to date. Uh, with the with the new methods that were were being invented, and they agreed that Sterp 
um, could be present when the sample was selected, and that STIRP could even be there in the labs when the pretreatment cleaning and the measurements were done. And when it ended, eight years of lobbying and backstabbing and, and deception that Gove brags about in his book. And please read that book if you think I'm exaggerating. He's, he's just proud of himself, what he's done. And Stirp, who always advised, take a couple samples from a couple locations. Um, that, that would have solved it right there. And even when they found the problems with, with the outliers, they could have talked to the Institute of Meteorology or to turn and say, why don't you give us another sample from another location and see what that is. No, they, they cut everyone off, never told anyone, put it in the official report and thus to the world, these manufactured dates and eliminated eight actual major dates out of 16. They took half your dates and eliminated them and replaced them with four artificial dates. That's not scientific at all. Let's, let's, let's try a slightly different, uh, different approach. So supposing they hadn't um, collated any of the dates, supposing they had simply said we had 16 or 12 samples from the shroud, and every single one has dated the eagle. That's all you can say. Well, if you got a date from a blood sample, um, and, and it dated 25,000 years in the future, and you got another date that said it dated 25,000 years in the future from another lab, would you conclude that it's 25,000 years um, yeah, I guess that would be younger than you. Well, that, that would be silly. And if you ignore the, the discrepancy in the dates, um, you, you wouldn't be scientifically at all. You'd be forcing a square peg into a round hole. But, well, no, it depends what your, your, um, how close they were. I would, if someone said that the blood was 25 years into the future and someone else said it was 24.9, then I'd say they're close enough to be the same. No, I didn't say 25 years. I said 25,000. Not 25,000, but I mean, <clears throat> it's not likely to be like that. But if we've got these things, they're all medieval. Now, it may be, and perhaps this would have been more sensible if the British Museum had said, we've got 12 dates which are incompatible to be a single, to give a single date to the shroud. There is some reason why they're different. That's exactly what they should have done. They, well, they did say that, and what they said when? was... When? In the to, report, Donahue, to Donahue. No, in the, in the report, it says that we noticed that the Arizona dates were different, or one of the dates was different from the others. That's the reason why they did the... Um, the T squared, uh, the chi squared test, and where they then said, how do we explain this? And what their explanation was, and this, they probably, it was a mistake, I think. Their explanation was that the uh, errors quoted were wrong. Now, I think they could have explained it by, by saying that there was some kind of unremoved contamination. Minor contamination getting slowly more or less along the strip would have changed the date by 30 or 40 years which is what we actually see in the shroud so if for example and I, i'm sort of uh, speculating here but hydrocarbons hydrocarbons are very difficult to remove using normal technique so if a little hydrocarbon at different intensities was left in, it would make the dates slightly different along the length of the sample strip. I think you can argue that the carbon-14 dating was accurate and that the shroud was medieval. You can't take it off center one way or the other. But finding out the real date of the sample 
is just one of the few things that could be done if you tested the shroud at the molecular and atomic levels. If you tested at the molecular level, you could find out the chemical content of all of the whole cloth and, and each location where they have different samples at. And you could find out even even thing you could test every naturalistic method, every uh, artistic method, um, all the hybrids, uh, whether there's an invisible reweave. You could test so many things. You could even test things like uh, whether there's uh, conjugated carbonyls or oxidized dehydrated cellulose, or whether there's actually discoloring where the coins supposedly are. Um, there's a lot of things you could, you could determine. You could determine the best places to take samples from. You could determine um, whether um, radiation now, I'm not sure this would be dispositive, and I'm talking about testing at the molecular level, but you could have a lot more input as to whether radiation is involved in the body images. And, and if it is particle radiation, you could, you could tell that at the, by testing at the atomic level. But you could answer just a whole range of things, a couple of things of which are whether this carbon dating was correct or not. But to hinge, all the evidence on one test that was very controversial in so many ways is just absurd. And it's not scientific at all. And there's nothing wrong with the science. I think the science for that small sample was indicating more than just what they thought. And, uh, but they only had one viewpoint from it. Um, and and they, they wanted center stage and, and they got it, but, but they don't want it anymore. Um, I, um, I think there's, there's good reason to test the shroud at the molecular atomic level for many reasons. And that's one of them. The let carbon. Me, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. You, let, no. me, uh, sorry let me, uh, let me. Should we follow that or, or no, I'll, I'll, I'll let you. Do. Uh, yeah, well, it's just before, um, I want to turn it over to Teddy. I, I do want to make sure that we do include, uh, some of the other things. So, so, um, you know, Mark. Mark's mentioning. Well, well, these are things that we c could do to test the hypothesis. But in the first place, Mark, are are there any positive indications that we have, or evidence that we have here and now, that you think, yeah, we can link this thing to the historical Jesus that you'd like to discuss with you? And secondly, I, I'd also like you to discuss some of the things you um, like the weave. He says proof that it can't go back then, or, or its relation to this uh, ritual, the the quem. Well, I mean, there's there's uh, in my book, uh, both of them I describe. There's uh, ancient weaves. I think with ten to one or twelve to one uh, twills um, that uh, go back to Egyptian days. Um, I don't think a a, a three to one. Um, herringbone twill was beyond the capability um, of the first century. Now, it's rare, and it's, it's a finely woven cloth, and there's a lot of things uh, exceptional about that cloth, but it certainly wasn't impossible. Uh, Hugh, uh, what, what do you make of that? Uh, uh, yes, I think given the size of it, we have to uh, have some indication that a loom capable of doing it, um, and there is no such indication. Um, the, the 10 to 1, 12 to 1 um, things Mark is mentioning are Chinese, Chinese silk. There's no Egyptian um, stuff with 10 to 1 or 12 to 1, except for a very Thomas which are made literally by uh, individually threading the web over a number of threads. So I don't think there's any evidence of an appropriate proof. Um, were you, you were cutting out again. Were you saying that the, the, the um, uh, 10 to 1 and 12 to 1 twills were on small samples? No, well, either damasks or Chinese silk. There was no... Um, weave, linen or cotton weave like that in Egypt. 
or, or the Middle East at the time. Is it, is it, uh, well, if they could do it with silk, are you saying they could do it with silk but not linen? Yeah. I mean, if they could do it with linen, or if they could do it with silk, why couldn't they do it with linen? Well, they'd have to take it to China because China was the only place that had the rooms for it. And the Chinese didn't weave their linen in that way. Well, it's hard to keep technology like a loom from, from others uh, understanding it, isn't it? I mean, is, is that the only place in the world that it was done and, and nobody after, after, I mean, somehow... Oh, yeah. Uh, we, it, we can track the progress of this kind of complex weave. We can see where it was done in China, then we can see where it was done in India, and we can see where the same thing, technology, finally turned up in Europe in about 1000 AD. Well, I, I mean, Jerusalem was on the heart of all the trading centers. Yeah. And, and um, it could have come from anywhere. Um, and and the, the, the knowledge of this type of uh, different types of weaves could be understood or, or seen, or I mean, um, it, it's you, you don't have to have a, um, a loom from Jerusalem necessarily just to to. Uh, and, and I don't know where it was woven. I think Syria was. Uh, doesn't uh, um, Flory Lamberg say that uh, Syria was a center for weaving, especially yeah. linens? And this this uh, kind of loom arrived in Syria about 200 AD, but that's 200 years too. Well, yeah, but that's about 200 AD. I mean, do they have to keep every loom from every century to, well, to satisfy your thinking? One with uh, two. 200 AD is, uh, what, 170 years within the, the time of Christ? Um, isn't that close enough for the possibility? No, I'm, I'm afraid not. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's kind of, uh, oh, I don't know. No, I that's think these things can be fairly, um, you know, dated to within 100 years or so. And if it's 100 years out, it's 100 years out. I think oh, there is. Uh, they don't have, do they, do they, are you going on, sir? well, I, I just think that just because there's no surviving record of it doesn't mean it couldn't have happened, especially when, when the Chinese and Egyptians we're already weaving more complicated things um, centuries before. Uh, uh, no, to to no. just thread the needle and say, well, they couldn't have been done uh, 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 any earlier in Jerusalem or Syria is, is kind of silly. We don't even really know where the cloth came from. Well, uh, this is another test which, which uh, you might be able to do while they're, while they're doing your radiation test. The next one is I want them to do an isotopic analysis of the linen. And I've often mentioned that. I think that the, uh, an isotopic analysis of some of the, of the linen itself would say exactly where it was made. I don't know. Uh, Sterp wanted to do something similar to that in the mid-80s. You can do it with rock. I don't know how easy it is to do with cloth because it's mostly cellulose, which is difficult. Uh, Hugh, if, if you don't mind me, me stepping in here, just before, again, I, I want to turn it over to Teddy soon, but this will be the last topic that I want to see you guys sort of discuss before we go to Teddy. Uh, I asked you to look into the evidence from the Sudarian, and I personally think this is the, the strongest evidence that we have that this thing isn't medieval. Um, so I'll, I'll let you have the first word on the sedarium. You did, you know, what, what do you make of that evidence? I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that, are you, are you falling into Mark's idea that a couple of hundred years one way or the other doesn't make a difference? The sedarium has been carbon dated twice, and it came to 700 AD. Now, going through the same radiation business, well, I know that Mark and Bob Rucker will, will do the radiation business, uh, or, or, or are we going to claim of 700? That's, that's almost the same at the time as Jesus. Is it close enough? Rather like the loom? Okay. All right. well, no, it wouldn't be. Well, no, that's an answer for da uh, D D uh, Dale, really, rather than you, Mark, because I know that you think that, that the, the sudarium was radiated as well. Is that right? Um, it could have been. I don't know if it is. No, 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 no. You, could, you could test the, the linen, the blood, and the watery fluid from the sudarium and, um, and see. 
yeah. whether yeah. it was irradiated, and you could and you could figure out how many additional carbon-14 atoms were created at that time in addition to the carbon-14 that's remaining in the, in the linen or the blood um, from its original um, period. And, yeah, and, and since you, you asked me, I'll, I'll just tell you my, so my opinion is the same as Bob Rucker's. He, I think that that 780 date does fall within the neutron flux hypothesis. So, you know, it's consistent with that data. And historians know that it dates prior to that. Even the, the carbon-14 scientists themselves said the date is, is, is wrong. And they didn't say that. They right. didn't say that. Go ahead. They, they told it was wrong. So then they said, if it's wrong, then one possibility is that it was contaminated with oil. That was, that was the scientific reply. They, Hugh, they, you're you're breaking up a yes. whole lot. I'm having. I, I, think, I think what he's saying he's talking about they attributed oil contamination, but what what he's disputing with me is uh, the carbon fourteen scientists didn't say that it was the case. They said it could be, and if it's that, is that what you're debating there, Hugh? Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, like a, like I said, we we have. Well, this isn't a, a debate with me, but I, I think we have independent historical evidence to know that it dates prior to that. So, yeah, that's that's what I would answer with that. And that's a maximal date because it dates to 700 AD doesn't mean it couldn't be back to the first century. Um, but what I'm most interested in, it, it's the link. I, I wanted you guys to sort of discuss, uh, can we prove that the Sudarium is in fact linked to the graph? Um, so, so, yeah, did, did you look into that at all, or is, is your primary reason you just, it dates to 700 AD, therefore it's it's not helpful or something? Uh, no, not really. Um, it's, its relationship to the shroud depends on the geography of the blood stains. And I don't think they match as definitively as people think. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mark, Mark what, is, that, is that true? I, I, I agree with that point. I've never understood when people say that the blood marks on the sidereum match those on the shroud. I, I've, uh, it, it's just, um, I don't see it myself. But I mean, you could find similarities if you tested both of the cloths at the molecular and atomic level. But right now, there's there's nothing dispositive to indicate a connection between the two. I think there's a lot more tests that could be done on the sidarium that hasn't been done. It isn't nearly as much as uh, as occurred to that as, as the shroud. And um, I think they should be done regardless of what the results are. Excellent. Well, that, that was a revelation for me, actually, so that's good. So, yeah, I, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Teddy. And I'll, you know, she can take over and, and probe both sides on, you know, what was it, Teddy, a panel, what you call it? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. You said, what about a panel? Oh, I was just at, what do you call it in, in uh, you told me in the courts it's called a panel. Oh, oh, well, yeah, but you're having a pellet argument. Uh, just there's a panel of judges that tend to ask uh, questions um, of both sides. So uh, if yeah. we could go back, to, or, are y'all ready for me to? Yeah, go, go for it, Teddy. You, you've got the next. Fi I'll give you 15 minutes to, to do your thing on the okay. date. Okay, uh, and I've got I've got questions for um, both Mark and Hugh. Um, so first of all, regarding the radiocarbon testing, uh, there's the presumption that this is bulletproof. When the 1988 tests, test results came out, uh, so many people who uh, believed in the authenticity of the shroud, uh, once they heard the test results, uh, many people ended up just flipping and then deciding, oh, well, it has to be a fake, as, as uh, it was pronounced to be, because the test results put it during the medieval time period. Um, 
with with uh, Mark, let me ask you: Do you think uh, radiocarbon dating is bulletproof? Well, nothing's nothing's bulletproof, uh, or very few very few things are bulletproof. It's not a hundred percent. No. Do you think it's anywhere even close to a hundred percent? Um, probably, probably. Uh, uh, I mean, there's been some famous mistakes that was made in, in carbon dating, and a lot of it has to do with contamination. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's one piece of evidence. Uh, I can tell you that if you look at the scientific um, evidence uh, from the shroud, it's the only outlier, if you will. The... the um, uh, there's a lot of scientific evidence indicating that um, this is this is a, a, a very we'll get I mean I'm getting a little ahead of myself but all the unique features on the body images uh, and the blood marks um, indicate this is just no ordinary a burial cloth especially from the Middle Ages and you yeah. can still make that conclusion independent of or or with the carbon date. Or, sure. or if the carbon date was refuted. Teddy mustn't give the impression that nobody knew one way or the other until the carbon date came along. Uh, there were a lot of people who thought that the shroud was medieval and the carbon dating simply confirmed what they thought. And what were the reasons that people were thinking that it, were, that it was medieval? Um, for all those reasons that uh, we've already said. Just because, well, but the Egyptians, I mean, there, and there are textile experts who have put the, the, uh, the weave of the cloth in the shroud uh, between the first and fifth century, which is way before medieval times. Well, well the, 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 main, the main reason was that for centuries, the cloth from the, from the cloth presence in Europe in the, in the 14th century, it was um, assumed to be a painting. Now, it was on very frivolous grounds, but that was the main reason. It had only been a few years before that, just a few years before 1988, that Sturp had pretty much dispositively disproved that it was a painting. But that was the primary reason. Well, no, Hugh, what about... The issue of banding that we see on the shroud. Uh, banding is, the banding that is seen on the shroud is highly uh, indicative of the yarn being bleached, the fiber being bleached, and then uh, woven, as opposed to what they did in medieval times, which was where they would weave the cloth then uh, bleach it uh, in the field. And that would give uh, a nice uniformity to the color. So the fact that there is banding on the shroud uh, definitely takes it away from the medieval period, especially of Europe, in, in terms of what their cloth looked like, where it, it had a nicer uniformity to it. Yeah, it's a good try, um, but it's uh, it's based, all the banding stuff seems to be based on what somebody thinks Pliny the Elder wrote in his encyclopedia. Now, his encyclopedia is still in print, and it doesn't say anything about this hang bleach business. Uh, I'm sorry, you were, you were cutting out. It, it didn't say anything about the what business? Hank bleating. This is a popular myth. Cloths were always bleached, either by by uh, field bleaching. There's no such thing as Hank bleaching. There's no well, evidence for it. Well, I mean, first Doesn't of all, just it's common sense. People spin some fiber, and people dye it colors well they can also bleach it i mean people bleach hanks of fiber nowadays why wouldn't they do it back then when things were so much more primitive that that makes absolutely no sense to me 
people no, no. can do it any which way they want. I mean, it's still done. Well, no, not really. And it's done in a, in a slightly different way. You want your cloth to look the same color. So the fact that you get all your hanks of cloth, you weave them, and then you bleach it all together. And then it ends up the same color. If you bleach everything separately, you'd end up with very distinct stripes, which you don't get. I think you're looking at uh, Barry's transmission photo, and a transmission photo does show banding, very distinct banding, but that's more to do with the density of the, of the way the band was woven, not with the color of the cloth. I, I agree. agree. Um, I don't think it. Um, I've always been skeptical of uh, um, that the shroud was bleached uh, or dyed. Uh, I haven't seen any hard evidence for it. Um, the, uh, they do did usually um, as just as as far as an extensive uh, reading process would just ex, uh, continue it longer. And putting it and putting the um, cellulose uh, in the sun uh, constantly after it was uh, beaten against the rocks and, and soaked and started to rot or rot and uh, laid it out in the field. I, I haven't seen evidence of bleach on the shroud. I think it goes back to Ray Rogers and um, on that and several other points. I just don't think he makes his case at all. So let me ask y'all, speaking of the, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Hugh. No, only, Rogers was misquoting Finney. Rogers, okay. Uh, let me ask y'all, uh, concerning the issue of, uh, we mentioned dye, but well, actually I'll be getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I, I first wanted to, regarding the radiocarbon dating, uh, so we all we all agree that it's not bulletproof or anywhere close to bulletproof and that there have been monumental blunders with radiocarbon dating where, for example, there are uh, what they call modern living samples that have given ages of uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And there have been centuries old uh, samples that have given dates into the future. So are, are we all in agreement that radiocarbon dating, while uh, people still perhaps consider it the gold standard, this gold standard uh it's it's not uncommon, and archaeologists are are saying that they they see uh, errors all the time, and that it is a tool that we use, and that uh, if we see other indicators that something is much older than what the date appears then by no means is the radiocarbon dating dispositive of anything. It's, it's not a hard science and everything else is a soft science. It's all, you know, all of the scientific tests that are done on the shroud. We, we have to take these all into consideration as a whole, right? No, no not at all. Why not? If, because if the radiocarbon dates in, um, is, peculiar. is peculiar. We then find out why it's peculiar. Hello, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, you you completely cut out. If the radiocarbon dating is peculiar, we want to find out why it's peculiar. I'm sorry, why it's what? I couldn't hear you. Why it's peculiar? Why it's odd? Okay. Well, how about we get into that? So, okay. and, and Teddy, let, 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 this, let this be your last question for you and, and, uh, and Mark, and then we can move on to the next section. Uh, well, there, are, there are a couple of really important things regarding carbon dating, especially okay. given okay. that if we could get in a couple of things. Do you think, and, and just, would you be able to get it done in about 
six minutes, do you think? And if I give you an extra extra time there? Uh, I'll do my best. So um, with the issue with dating, first of all, at the time that they did the dating back in 88, it was uh, known that uh, dating textiles, especially linen, was very much in the air. Usually radiocarbon dating, and when we tend to see more accurate results, it tends to be with things like bone, uh, harder substances. And the issue of textiles, even the people that... Um, uh, beta analytic, and I've got a quote here. It's like one of the most renowned companies for radiocarbon dating states that fabric dating can be done only as part of a multidisciplinary research and that samples taken from fabric treated with additives or preservatives uh, generate a false radiocarbon age. Now, when I read this and I saw the word preservatives, you know what immediately popped into my mind? And I don't know if I'm the first person to ever say this or not. Maybe I'm not. I, I haven't come across this before. But I was remembering from reading in um, an article by uh, Adri Vanderhoven when she was talking about the yellow matter dye, which we, we do know that in the radiocarbon sample, uh, yellow matter dye was detected. Now, this yellow matter dye, here's what Adri Vanderhoven says. She said, matter dye is not color fast. But when it is mordanted red, the mordant has a protective activity against degradation. So then my question is, because that sounds an awful lot like a preservative to me, perhaps that yellow matter dye, and uh, there's the real question, because yellow matter dye is soluble in uh, toluene and xylene, which was what was used to remove the adhesive from the sticky tapes. Uh, I think that Adri Vanderhoven is correct that that might be why uh, when the fibers were tested from the whole, from the whole uh, cloth, they didn't see the yellow matter dye but why when they tested it uh, for the shroud, for the radiocarbon sample, they did see the yellow matter dye. And so uh, her, she was saying that this yellow matter dye is only, it, it's on the whole cloth. It's not what is comprising the image or the blood stains, but that it's it was just part of the manufacturing process. And also, she has made the argument that that is one of the reasons why the cloth is in such great condition, because uh, this yellow matter dye also provides antifungal and antimicrobial aspects to the shroud. But again, those are all preservatives, and that could very well, I think, account for why the radiocarbon date, uh, given that this guy from Beta Analytics, one of the best C14 dating companies, said that preservatives generate a false radiocarbon age. So what do y'all think? Yeah, it's scientifically completely unsound. And so you're saying that the guy from Beta Analytic doesn't know his own business? No. Right, let, let's let Hugh come back and then Mark can the, have a say. The, uh, any preservative that Beta Analytic is talking about is a preservative added to the material much, much later. So if, for example, a piece of Neolithic fish has been kept in a museum, it could have been treated with some kind of thing to stop it rotting away. And that would have a big effect on the radiocarbon. If you put a preservative 
on something the same date as the thing it the radiocarbon date. Hugh, you're you're cutting out a whole lot. I'm I'm having trouble understanding. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, could you repeat it? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, if if the preservative is the same date as the material, mm -hmm. it reads the same radiocarbon date. Denmark. Well, you could test the shroud at the with hyperspectral imaging and determine this and many other questions. I myself, uh, I doubt that such a preservative is on the shroud because the center of the fibers are white and the outer rims of the image fibers are yellow. I don't think you could apply a preservative if, if, if that has anything to do with the coloration on the shroud um, that I thought Teddy might have been implying. But at any rate, bottom line is, that's one of the many things you could determine by examining the shroud at the hyperspectral uh, level. Yeah, I, I think that should be it. Now, Teddy, I don't want to end prematurely. If, is there anything else on the eating issue that you guys, uh, and as long as you guys aren't, aren't in a hurry or anything like that, is there anything else about the dating issue that anyone wants to raise as a final discussion before we move on to the next topic? Um, just one other thing, and that's just to emphasize about the protocol being breached, even uh, aside from STIRP's mm -hmm. protocol that they laid out. I think they were wanting, what, six samples from various areas of the shroud in order to see whether or not there was consistency in the dating and that was breached but who wanted, in terms of who, i'm who sorry wanted, who wanted that it, it, who wanted what the six who samples wanted, yeah it was start that was part of their protocol uh, yeah but they the scientists weren't following the protocol so they didn't well that meet. was because wasn't it Ganella or somebody that they no. were forced to not do that no they weren't that's the, not my understanding. There, there was a third protocol. Uh, uh, the first two protocols did call for taking samples from different locations. It didn't specify the number six. Uh, however, the last protocol um, said that uh, you know, a sample will be taken from a single uh, location. And, um, but it also said that the raw data would be shared with... Um, the British Museum and the Institute of Meteorology. Wasn't that pushed though by the church because they wanted to preserve the aesthetics of the shroud? I thought, wasn't it Ganella that was pushing for just the one? If, if, if you ask me, if somebody asks me to carry out a scientific test on something they own, I follow their instructions. I don't follow the instructions of somebody. Well, the church at that time, well, no, at that time the church did have uh, control. Uh, but, but that doesn't speak to the reliability of the results when the protocols breached. When you, the, the, you think that the protocol was breached. I've seen the protocol. It was written in Giovanni Riggi's handwriting, and I think it's in the material um, Tristan Fabianca got from the British Museum. Right, but that wasn't Sturp's protocol. It mm. was carefully thought out. Yeah, but Sturp's protocol was not accepted. Right, right, but that Which was poor judgment, if you ask me, because... <laughs> Because it, obviously it would have been uh, more convincing if we found different areas of the shroud uh, matching up in terms of the dates as opposed to an area that they tested which had water stains and scorch and it had been scorched. I mean, it was and handled. That was usually 
the spot where they were always holding the shroud when they were displaying it. So it was like probably the worst, most contaminated part of the shroud to test. Um, it was as far away from the scorch area as it's possible to be. The idea that it was near a scorch is absurd. No, I, I've I, well, it, I've read multiple sources that that area that. was scorched. Yeah, maybe well, not that. the deep scorch, but it, no. it was a scorched area. I think it was Adler that said that. Just yeah, he did. He's wrong. Very wrong. Well, He's I don't wrong. know about that. I'll I'll have to do some digging. Uh, <laughs> Adler never advocated a scorch, but the image samples, the image fibers are similar to the light scorch areas on the shroud. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I think that covers it for, for the dating issue. We, we've raised some, some good issues to think up there, but I, I really want to move on to the, to the image features themselves, and we're sort of hinting on that in, in what we're discussing here. Um, but yeah, what, okay, what is it that we actually know about uh, the body and blood stain images um, and even the off off uh, off uh, shroud man images well what is it that we know scientifically about this and and Hugh got the first word uh, in the last section and mark got the last word so in this time this time it's gonna be mark uh, you can give your 10 minute opening speech as to, to what you think of the you know what what are the most important image features that we know about the shroud that speak to image formation that and then he will get the last word in the second well, in my 2015 book, you'll see, I think, 32 features on the shroud. Um, only one agent, radiation, can duplicate or account for all of these features. Um, and these features are only found on the parts of the cloth that laid they draped over the body and laid under the body. And um, in light of that, um, you can certainly form, a, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to form a hypothesis that radiation from the body could explain all these features. Now, I know that sounds a little strange, but when this is actually consistent with the historical accounts, and these are no ordinary historical accounts. The Gospels and the New Testament were the most popular and, uh, and attested documents in ancient history, and, and they continue to be the most widely read uh, sources in modern history. And um, when you have those two things, uh, then you have ability to at least test whether radiation could have been involved or not. And a lot of, a lot of uh, people think, well, this isn't scientific. Well, it is scientific. It's just, it's just not something that a scientist could do. You can't make radiation, particularly particle radiation, come from a body. However, you could test to see if such an event occurred. You're never going to duplicate it. Let's all agree on that. But you could test to see whether such an event occurred. Uh, okay, so Hugh, I'll give it to you. you. You have 10 minutes or less to make your opening speech about what, what are the, the actual features of, of the shroud that are the most relevant to you? Okay, um, what I, I'm going to say is that the only features we can work on um, is uh, what it looks like. I was very impressed the other day when Teddy pointed out that toluene dissolves matter. Because I think that toluene, toluene dissolves everything. Could you repeat that, please? I couldn't hear it. Toluene dissolves almost everything. It Did you spell it? T-O-L-U-E-N-E. 
dissolves masses of stuff. What's in your evidence for that? Oh, uh, Teddy, this is his oh, open. Sorry, so sorry. It's used, right, sorry. It's used. Sorry. It's an organic solvent used in masses of things. It would not only dissolve matter, it would dissolve almost any guy. It would dissolve almost any binder. Dissolves a lot of pigment. Wouldn't get rid of iron oxide. It's true. But it would dissolve so much that it's not surprising that Heller and Adler were left with fibers completely stripped of anything that might have been. The only thing it didn't dissolve was blood. So I find right, I, I made up a story. Somebody dumps a cake, a cake in front of me and says, can you duplicate this cake? And I say, yeah, give me the recipe. And they say, no. So I say, okay, give me the cake. And I'll try and reverse engineer it. And they say, no. So I say, how oh, can I copy it? And they say, we took a sample, we washed it thoroughly, and we've got some raisins, and that's it. Now, this can't do it. It's a miracle. That's that's that's, that's the problem that reproducing this crowd are dealing with. Reverse engineering is very difficult, even if the original process was very simple. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, great. Okay. Well, thank you for your opening speech there, uh, for, from both of you guys. Um, now, I want to open it up the informing section part, but I just want to make sure that the section, we're not, we're not focused on informing mechanisms. Radiation, plausible, uh, the, uh, Dale, I, you're cutting out really bad too. This is uh, this is terrible, isn't it? Uh, there we go. Is it working now? Okay. It's a little bit better now. Okay, so I, I just want to stress this: this section is not about image, image forming mechanisms. I, I don't care if radiation works or not. We're going to discuss that next. I don't care, you know, about any of the, the mechanisms. It, we're just trying to identify what are the actual physical chemical features that are most important for us to know. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I can go back and I can list some of them and see what you guys think of them as a discussion point. So, I think it's going to be uncontroversial. We all agree that shroud is a photographic negative, or at the very least, a quasi negative image. We both agree on it. Does everyone agree about that? Sort of. Sort of, okay. Not just you get from a woodblock print. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and Mark? I'm sorry. I, I, you were cutting out on my end. Well, could you repeat your question real quickly? Um, so, so yeah, I, I was just trying to see what, what are some of the image features that we can agree, uh, agree on or disagree on, and then that could provide some discussion. So, so there's the photographic negativity. Um, there's the, the topographic information on the shroud uh this is for the body images you know the three-dimensional nature that people follow uh there's there's no foreign materials or or particulates on the image um what about the for the uh, vertically mapped wrapping distortions um does do both sides agree about that or is there a dispute there no i agree with that you agree with that okay all right um no. okay what about body image uniformity? It, it, there's a less than a 10% difference in, uh, in the in color and the intensity of the color on the fibers throughout both body images. Uh, Hugh, do you concur with that? Do you have an issue with the body image uniformity feature? No, no that fits in entirely with my hypothesis. Okay. Um, what about body image superficiality? So here's some, I, I note uh, there are different levels of superficiality. So I, I saw a thing in February of 2019, and Hugh Ferry was kind of debating with Colin Barry, saying that the superficiality isn't 
proven true at that fiber level. It's not on the outermost, the primary cell wall or something like that, something along those lines. So, yeah, what what do you guys make of body superficiality? Are they, is that true? Are there three levels of superficiality? Is there a dispute there? Yeah, do you want me to clarify that? Yeah, yeah. Each color fiber is only colored on the primary cell wall. Yeah? So it's, it's only on the primary cell wall, okay? Yeah, that's each fiber. And now each thread is made of 100 fibers, and only the top, say, three, four fibers of each thread are colored. Does that, is that good? Perfect. Yeah, Mark, do you? you um, generally, I think a thread has about 200 fibers, and I've heard uh, many stirrup scientists say, no, it's only one or two fibers deep. But generally, we agree completely on gotcha. that. Okay, perfect. Um, what about what about characteristics of the uh, blood stains, for example? So I know Mark's done some experimentation on the blood. What, what I'll throw it open to you to, to start, Mark, and have you come back. What are some of the features of the blood stains that are important? Well, it's still red after all these centuries. Um, the edges, I'm talking about like the edges on the, around the clock, uh, they're unbroken. There is serum around the edges. It, it uh, does appear to be human blood. They're also uniquely aligned on the body image, but of course it's only the positive body image, um, not the negative image. Um, they are embedded in the cloth. Even the scourge marks are embedded, and most of them are visible on the back side. Some of the body images, uh, uh, some of the blood marks appear to be encoded as body image, although most of them are encoded just as blood. And they also, in general, appear on the cloth in the same way that they would form and coagulate on a body. And uh, make a long story short, no one's ever come close to duplicating them, uh, let alone the blood marks and the body images. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, it, it, this, this could be a, a fruitful area for discussion if you, if you disagree with anything that Mark said there. I, I don't know that anybody's tried much in the way of duplicating um, the blood images. I know there's been a suggestion, uh, which was quite clever, which Adri uh, van der Hoven contemplates, that the blood could have been applied from leech, which is not impossible, I suppose. I'm sorry, I can hear you that the blood was applied what? from a leech, a medicinal leech, oh. a small worm filled with blood, putting it on a person. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, which, which has some of the hemolytic properties um, of the blood in the shroud, or seems to. Well, when it comes to naturalistic or artistic explanations, to me, if you're going to argue that, you have the burden of proof. That's testable. And you should, you should test it out one way or the other and demonstrate. And there's a lot you'd have to demonstrate um, to duplicate, you know, the blood images or the blood marks or the body images on the shroud. But um, throwing things out like that, I mean, she, she's pretty good, though. She'll probably do some tests and experiments if she hasn't already. But the proof is in the, in the pudding, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, uh, what about this? Oh, sorry, Hugh, did you have something to say? Just, I don't have access to enough blood to be able to come, uh, experiment with it enough. What do you mean you don't have access to it? Well, I'm not going to chop holes in me just to produce lots of blood and dribble it off. Well, I mean, uh, a doctor or somebody, if you had a volunteer, I mean, everybody's got, what, uh, yes. 
six pints of blood. I mean, there's and there's seven billion people. I'm sure you can find enough to do some experiments. Mark, didn't you go to a slaughterhouse uh, for yes. and did a, a tremendous yes. amount of experimenting and still could not duplicate the oh. the, the blood clot exudates on the shroud? See, I, I want you to know, I, I participate in experiments. I was a guinea pig. <laughs> I, I used my hairy arms and they would throw the, the no Art Lynn, the physicist, did all the experiments and I'm I'm there as one of the, the flunkies, you know. Ah. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, but yeah, he, he was very ingenious and um um he he couldn't duplicate them and, and uh, uh I haven't seen anyone duplicate the blood marks. In some ways I think they're more remarkable. Or, or comparable to the body images and their uniqueness. And I, if I remember correctly, didn't Paul Vignon uh, try as he might to duplicate yeah. them and just could not, and especially 60 to 100 plus and without smearing them, but also getting the a full imprint like we see on the shroud. A lot of times he would have partial imprints. Yes, and, and so did uh, Vignon. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, so did Barbet. Yes. You're right. Wilcox talks about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, all right. And uh, a couple other things to, to ask you guys about in terms of uh, the shroud images and stuff. So in the first place, one thing that gets neglected, what, what, about, what do you guys make of the, the non-shroud man images? So I think some people have said there's flowers or images or something like that. Um, is there any truth to this uh, at all? Do you guys think? No. None Mark? whatever. None whatever from me. Mark. Oh, uh, it it might be fifty fifty. I I don't know. Um, um, it it's uh, this is another thing that that looking at at the uh, at the shroud at the uh, with hyperspectral imaging, um, you could see if there's any coloration where there's alleged uh, flower stems or buds uh, or coins. Um, I, I completely disagree. I don't think there's any phylacteries or some of the other things, but there's a possibility of uh, coins and in, uh, in flowers. But gosh, if you mention it, 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 <laughs> it almost gives someone a, a reason to attack it if you put it in there or if you quote somebody else who, who's got a position or something. It's, it's, they'll just focus on that and, and miss everything else. And it's something you've got to discuss or should discuss, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's like the other things. If, if you're going to argue that there's um, coins or flowers um, on the shroud, then, then they need to conduct some tests to see one way or the other. Obviously you want to do non-destructive testing, um, but uh, the proof's in the pudding. Great. Okay. So that, that's another area of agreement. It, it's iffy at best not to use those things. Here, here's one that I think you guys can have some good discussion on. I know for a fact you will. Um, the anatomical accuracy of the, the Shroud Man. Um, so I'm gonna, again, this section, I'm going to start with Mark because Hugh, Hugh should get the last word when we're discussing in this section. So, Mark, uh, is it true that the Shroud Man is anatomically accurate uh, or is he? Accurate, but not perfect. Um, the, obviously, the fingers are too long. Um, if you look at the inaccuracies on the shroud body image, to me, they indicate something more is going on. Look closely. All right, let's go back to the fingers. Picture a guy with his his hands have obviously been placed uh, over his pelvic region. Um, and his uh, fingers, are the right hand is curved over the left hand. If a cloth was draped over that hand and is falling, and the hand, uh, it, the bones are right on the surface, if they're giving off some radiation, as is disappearing, you would get long fingers when you hold the cloth out straight. Now, I can't prove that 
in a laboratory, obviously. Look at the right thigh, you know, between the knees and the hips of a man in the shroud. Look on the, on the positive body images. Look at the left thigh, look closely. You'll see there's about twice the thickness on the right thigh than the left thigh. You can tell from the frontal and dorsal images that the man's legs are the same size, especially looking on the dorsal side on the back of the thighs, they're, they're the same size. But you have a distortion there and it's because the left leg is slightly raised and you make a tent-like effect there. You can look at some of these imperfections. Um, you'll see some vertical lines going down the chin. And if a cloth was falling through a radiant disappearing body, you get some vertical lines there. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the cloth might fold at the neck and you get this odd rectangular shape there at the neck. I, I go into more examples in my book, but oddly enough, the, the imperfections um, may indicate there's, there's something more to this, and, and a forger wouldn't put these imperfections in there. Um, and they wouldn't form in, in that way naturally. Gotcha. Hugh, Hugh, what do you make? Are the Shroud Man's images anatomically accurate, in your opinion? Or uh, what do you make of that? Well, no, they're not. But the, the reason for that is because, of, to my mind, it's because of the way the image was carved on the, on the Shroud. I mean, on the Shroud, on the mold from which it was imprinted. So, I mean, it's very easy for a medievalist to say, Oh, well, it, it, he just couldn't do it perfectly because um, that's what authenticity you know, they all agree. The problem is that every authenticist has a different interpretation of the anatomical accuracy. So, Teddy has mentioned at some point that the leg are foreshortened. In other words, yeah. But if they're shorter than they ought to be, then in real life they were about fifteen percent longer. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. I sorry. can't either. No. It's, it's choppy. Yeah. I, I, I cut part of it, but not the if, last part. If the legs are foreshortened on the shroud then in real life they were 10 to 15 percent longer is that what you think are you asking me or or mark either of you mark didn't go for the foreshortening I, I i just don't think there's enough evidence for that and the legs are upraised and um you can't see uh, on the frontal image, you can't even see the feet. I, I, I've, there's an article that I've read uh, a while back where it got into all the, I think they referred to them as anthropometric measurements. And if anything, people are always talking about the arms being too long, but that deals with the dislocation of the arms as well as possible stretching of the arms during the whole process of the crucifixion uh, hanging on the cross. But um, in term, it, and when they have done measurements of the arms and of the legs, it's, it's always the arms that appear too long. But again, there was the dislocation and the breaking of rigor mortis. Um, but when you, there's clear foreshortening, as we were debating uh, in our debate, um, you can see that the knees are lifted up, uh, and so that would put it on a different plane than the rest of the body, and that is what how can, foreshortening how, is. How can you see that the knees are lifted? 
you you can just see it from the image just like you can see anything else you can see that that there is a lifting up of the knees and it's it's, no, it's no, clearly foreshortened you can't see that the knees are lifted because you're looking straight down on something you you can look on the dorsal and the frontal image and it appears the left leg is raised at the knee mm -hmm. Mark, what, what do you, because this is something that Hugh, uh, one of our, our listeners, uh, Tyler B, has brought up. So uh, I'm bringing it up. I'm drawing attention to the to the long arms. This is something that I, I've tried to answer before, and they keep bringing it up. So, you know, and, and Hugh's uh, confirmed this. So what what is the explanation for the long arms? Is this? Well, I, I, I you can't see from the elbows to the shoulders. That's due to the fire of 1532. All you can see is basically from the elbows to the end of the elongated fingers. Now, some people think that the man in the shroud, his arms are too long because if you were laying flat on your back and tried to put your hands over your pelvic region and cover your, your private area, which I'm sure the barriers were doing, um, then you might you have a little bit of a problem of the arms reaching. It still covers it, but not completely. But the man could have, you know, had, a, had an arch in his back from, from hours of, of being crucified, and his back could be a little bit elevated. And as Hugh said, looking straight on, you can't tell if the back was flat down on the, on the floor or not because parts of the body that were not normally touching um, the cloth on the dorsal side are encoded. So um, it, uh, most people assume that the, the arms are too long because they can't reach over the pelvic region if you're laying flat on your back, but you can't assume he was laying flat on his back. But if you're arched a little bit, it can cover, and you can try that yourself on a hardwood floor. What what do you make of that, Hugh? Does that satisfy you, or do you still think it's a problem? Or No, um, I, I agree with Mark, but what I'd like to sort of compare is I've been looking recently at uh, Giulio Fanti's anthropometric design of the man. Yeah? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, somewhat. Uh-huh. Oh, I've I mean, seen it's, it's, yeah, and also at uh, John Jackson's laying of the shroud, oh, um, a model of the shroud over his model of a man, which he did with um, uh, cat scanning. Well, and they also would use actual people is yeah. how they started out. There's, there's a lovely video which you can see of him laying and a copy of the shroud and shows how beautifully it fits over his... Uh, over his 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 man okay and but Giulio Fanti has also produced this incredibly detailed set of measurements demonstrating his man and the two men are different completely different one is lying flat and one has his legs bent and his head and shoulders bent now if two people using as precise measurements as they can, get two completely different results. That's worse than the radiocarbon data. Well, that's no reason to conclude uh, that the, the shroud is not authentic. Well, it I, is. It just, it, it, there's a, a number of explanations, but I don't think any explanation is dispositive. Well, one of them must be wrong. Well, that, that could be. That that very well could be. But I wouldn't conclude that the arms are too long when you can you can't see them from the elbows to the shoulder. And the, you just don't have enough to draw um, a, a dispositive conclusion. And the shoulders are too high. Plus, plus we knew that the the shoulders had to be dislocated yes. in order to. Uh, put the shroud man in the position that he was because he's clearly a crucifixion victim given the nail holes and the uh, and the bleeding and all of that so 
uh, obviously you can't get crucified with your arms crossed over the way the shroud man's are. So you've got the dislocation as well. You, you would have had to massage. I've talked to undertakers who, who get bodies in rigor mortis. And um, uh, very commonly done is you massage the shoulders and the neck so that you can manipulate um, the arms. And, and they probably did something like that. And the dislocation could have possibly come from that or, or from the crucifixion or, or any of the pre-crucifixion uh, tortures that he underwent. Plus, I've seen where I've read where they talk about how there can be stretching of the arms just from the crucifixion itself hanging for, you know, three hours or so on a cross. You can't you can't stretch the bone or, or, or it, well, it could dislocate the bone from the shoulder. Uh huh. There's a five degree difference between the uh, left shoulder and the right shoulder. OK. All right. Um, all right. Well, I think the, the last one I want to ask, um, last feature, and it's it's something that entails a lot, it is, okay, well, what is the composition of the uh, the Shroud Man's images uh, and that sort of thing? So I think we, we've both agreed that it is real blood, although Hugh has, has notions about uh, paint being used as well. Um, yeah, I, I shouldn't take that from you. Yeah, what, what do you guys make of the composition of both the body images and of the blood images. And Hugh, I'll, I'll let you go first this time. Oh, I think the blood's made of blood. But okay. I, I think it has uh, some kind of artificial substance making it they pick either uh, adder or uh, iron oxide or vermilion or a mixture. That's, that's the blood. And the image, I think, is made by uh, a, a chemical degradation of fibers or a dye. I'm sorry, I didn't hear a chemical degradation of what? Of the fibers. Okay. Or a dye staining the fibers. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mark, what do you make of that? Um, you could test all the things we've been talking about with hyperspectral imaging. The secondary image features that we were talking about, the primary image features, I, and every inch of the body, the length and width um, on the frontal and dorsal image, you could, you could analyze for all the different materials we've talked about, um, and it would be completely non-destructive. And I would think all sides of the spectrum would want to have more definitive information. It's completely non-destructive. Okay, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a, a free conversation. Anything you wanna say or take up on that, Hugh, or do you think it? Well, good? yes, but right. it's... it's I think that if I owned the shroud and I read Mark's book, I would go away and I would do those tests using the bits of stuff in in the from in the files from the from the restoration. Yeah. I yeah. Would Testing the charred material. I would do the carbon dating again, and I would have the. Uh, chemicals analyzed and if it proved and I would do all that secretly yeah secretly and if I found that the shroud was authentic I would authorize an official new scientific investigation but if I found that the shroud wasn't authentic I'd keep very quiet about it and that's why it hasn't happened there's Is that a conspiracy theory? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, I think what I'll do at this point, um, I'll turn it over to Teddy to do her cross-examination of, of both sides. Um, I'll, I'll give you 20 minutes because I'm trying to aim for about three hours for, for Mark's sake. That's what I promised him. Uh, so I'll give you about 20 minutes, uh, Teddy, to do cross-examination on, on the issue of the image features, not the formation of them, but the, the features themselves. 
Sure. Um, so here, uh, why, you obviously think that an artist created the cloth, right? The shroud? Yes. Yes. So why would an artist uh, in medieval times put the nail holes in the wrist area when it, everyone would expect them to be in the palms. Now, I, I know that you and I had gotten into, we briefly, uh, we didn't have enough time to get into it, but you mentioned, you know, the Zugabi, uh, uh, the Z area. I don't think you got to it specifically, but it, you were implying, and yes, it, it, nails in the upper palm of the hand can support a body during crucifixion. Uh, but, and, and in, in all of uh, the artwork that people see, it's always just in the palm. Why would an artist slash forger put it in the wrist? That would not make sense to the parishioners uh, since you thought that it was like an Easter a cloth that was brought out at Easter time as part of a ceremony, why would an artist put it in the wrist? That makes no sense. You. Right. I don't think it is in the wrist. So. But no, no, no. But on the shroud where the blood is, yeah. it's in the wrist. So it, it, the issue of where the entrance, when it, where, makes, where the entrance, where the nail goes in, is irrelevant to the cloth if it's a piece of artwork. Parishioners don't understand that. What makes you think it's in the wrist? Well, because that's where we see it on the image in uh -huh. the shroud. It's not. It's not now, in the palms. Can you see the knuckles of the of the, of the wrist of the, of the hand? Can you see where they are? Hold on, let me pull up a. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm looking at the picture right now. That is not the palm. No, no, and you've got two knuckles. The you knuckles are. Yeah, I see the knuckles. Can you see them? Now you. Draw a line from the two knuckles to where you think the nail hole is. Yeah, you're talking about the whole Z area coming at an angle. But if this no, is a no, piece no, of no, artwork. No, 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 no. Just do what I'm saying. Do, do, do a line from the two nail holes. Uh, no, from the one nail hole to each knuckle. And you, you end up with a, an angle, yeah? Yeah. Okay. What do you think that angle is? Is it more than 60 degrees? Is it I mean, not? I, I don't. I I don't know. But I know that this. If this is a piece of artwork, it doesn't no, no, make no. sense. No, to... it does. It's really, really important. If you're going for anatomical accuracy, which you think it is, then the angle between the two and knuckles and the blood hole will pinpoint on your hand exactly where the blood state is. And if that's you, a, that doesn't look to me to show where the wound starts, where the where the you, hole would start. I'm asking you to decide where the hole is. You make it up. Decide, decide where you think the hole is. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you well. You said decide where the hole is? Yeah, you decide. And then draw a line from that hole to each knuckle. Now, you can use a... a, a a protractor and investigate it later. But you will find that the angle is too wide for the hole to be in the wrist. You can just look at the picture. The picture. You can just look at the image and see where the palms are yeah. versus where. No, you can't the... see. The palm. No, no, no. That is, this is your mistake. Isn't it? You can't see the palms. Mark, what are you? Top of the palms. There is no such thing as the top of a palm. The, 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 the hand over the palm. You can only see the back of the of the of the hand. Do you do you know of any artwork in uh, during the medieval times or prior that has the hole and wound starting where the shroud man's hole and wound and blood marks starts. Yeah, so that's 
I yeah. have not seen any such. No, they all so, start lower. Shall I tell you I've why seen. you haven't seen it? Why is it? Because you're looking at crucifixions. But that's what the... No, they show the front of the house. Now, go back to your historical thing and look for lamentations or depositions or any other image of the dead Jesus where you can see the back of his hand. Then find out where the hole marks are. Well, do you know of any that, that show it in the position where the shroud man has it? I do, yeah. You Which won't one? find any where the the nail wound appears to be in the wrist and the thumbs are missing and the thumbs are missing on that picture of the shroud i'd have to go back and find some <laughs> yes but well, I can't, what's, I can't. what's the image that you were saying do you recall by any chance um the image that has it looking like the shroud man too a couple of salmon and takes so nothing off the top of your head but no i'm okay. i'll try and google it while, while we're talking well we can all you know google it yeah. um now what about the cap of thorns versus the circlet because when you uh i think it was vignon that did a detailed was it vignon that did the detail analysis of the thorn the puncture wounds around the head. Yeah. Uh, and he was saying that it, the, there were so many puncture wounds, it was not, it was way more than what one would expect for the traditional circlet that we see depicted in art. Uh, and that if this is a just a painting, then why are we seeing uh puncture wounds going up the head where it, it's more consistent with a cap of thorns like, yeah, i think I, they refer to it as like an oriental cap is how i've heard it any any kind of cap uh, you can't see the top of the head but we don't need to see the very top i think there's the what is it the parietal area of the head that goes up yeah. higher well it has a few scratches but nothing that would be in scratches yeah, well, but look, it, nothing that was inconsistent with an ordinary crown as we recognize it. But Secondly, a crown is thinner. When we see the circlet, that's a much thinner. Uh, you would have fewer puncture wounds than well, the, the amount that we see on the Shroud Man. The blood stains around the bottom of the head are, are obviously that's where the big collection is. And the thing is, the this this alleged cat i can't any evidence why or how anyone would suppose that a crown like a cat the gospels clearly use a word that means um, a, a ring a crown in a ring and they clearly don't use any word resembling cat well, it, it was obviously symbolic, right? So uh, guards uh, at the drop of a you know, hat, oh, well, no pun intended there. Uh, you know, <laughs> in just a, a moment's notice when they get the idea, oh, hey, let's mock Jesus uh, who says, you know, that he uh, is the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Uh, let's mock him with the crown of thorns and they you know, just spontaneously have the idea to do that. Uh, you know, they're not carefully crafting something and something also that's highly uh, prickly. So they're just kind of making a makeshift uh, crown, in air quotes, in order to mock him. So, I mean, I don't think that we should expect that this is some fine rendition of a crown akin to what Caesar would have. No, I think they just got a long, thin, whippy piece of thorn bush, twisted its ends together, and jammed it on his head. That but how it. do you expect those thorn wounds going up to the top? You know, uh, I, now I know the shroud, we don't have the image of the tip top of the head, but, uh, but it goes up far higher than one would expect with the traditional circlet. 
I, I think you're making up the traditional circuit. You try making one and then try and push it on your head and find out where those thorns get to. Well, just look at the, the, the positive images and, and you'll see them up toward the top of the head, especially on the dorsal. There's three on the dorsal and there's a couple on the uh, frontal. The frontal only goes a tiny bit higher than the brow. It hardly goes to the top of the head. Oh, no. Look, at there's, there's in, in the hair, which is a whole separate issue, but there's blood in the hair on the, the man's left side, on the frontal, and on the right side on the frontal and on the dorsal. You see two on his right side and one on his left side that are, there, that are near the top of the, of the head, the crown of the head. And see, crown can refer to the top of the head too. It's 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 called your crown, but uh, <laughs> it is. I got a big bald spot there on the crown. Um, but you got uh, three three blood marks on the dorsal, and and at least two more on the frontal that are up in the the toward the top of the hair. I mean, it's not a hundred percent proof, but it. No. it looks like more than just a circlet of uh, well, thorns. So I'll give you, you, I'll give you the, the last word on this thing. Uh, and Teddy, just uh, after that, you, do you have any questions to probe Mark on stuff that he said in this section as well? Uh, not not, not on this section okay. uh, that I can think of. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, then I'll just let it go. Uh, yeah, you, you, what do you, what do you make of what Mark okay. said on the grounds there? I think people have only suggested Capricorn in order to prove that a medieval person couldn't have done it and not biblical or illogical. Did you get that? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Ted, Teddy, go ahead and um, yeah, ask your remaining questions. Okay. Um, so now what about these... Uh, serum rings. I think you and I, in our last debate, we were talking a little bit about that, and you were saying that you uh, were thinking that they only assumed they were serum rings by how uh, they appeared. And I believe I said, well, no, I don't believe that was right. And they did the, what is it, bromesque or something like that green test that tests for serum albumin. Um, so how how do we get all these serum yeah. rooms and why would somebody bother to spend all sorts of hours putting collagen or something like that uh, to fake up, uh, you know, serum halos around all of these wounds just for a uh, a ceremonial cloth like what you had mentioned during our debate about uh, you know that you think that this shroud was used for why would somebody spend that kind of time and how would they even think or know to, to put that there no no, no no nobody carefully drew in the serum rings, but uh, if they used real blood, it would produce real serum. Well, serum, serum when it's applied directly to linen, uh, excuse me, blood when it's applied directly to linen does not create a serum ring. It uh, it usually needs to be on. What was it? Avery Vanderhoven was uh, distinguishing the different ways. And I think uh, maybe Gil Lavoie, uh, Dr. Lavoie, in terms of under what circumstances serum halos would come about. And um, part of it is that it's, it's during the uh, clotting of the blood when the linen is then attaching that it, it's at that point that you can then get those kind of serum uh, halos. It's not it's not an easy process at all to get these serum halos. So I'm just curious as to if you're having this vast relief. Well, we can we can add to that 
because as Mark will know, it's very difficult to keep blood running. You have to add anticoagulant, an anticoagulant. Such as lemon. Do you think those are available in the Middle Ages? Lemon juice, honey, either of those. Lemon juice would certainly act as an anticoagulant. If you look at Kelly Kearse's papers, he'll explain how he's used lemon juice and produced a serum ring, which fluoresces. But that's just the appearance of a serum ring. I mean, hum uh, albumin ah. was detected. So, so where, do you, where do you find albumin? Well, you can get it in an egg. Can, can't you? But an egg is, has, has a different chemistry. Oh, it doesn't. Albumin's only got one chemistry. Well, is there anyone who has tried creating a serum ring? Well, first of all, uh, does albumin from egg whites, does that work as an anticoagulant? No. It works as a binder for vermilion paint. But no, it, vermilion paint is would have such an opacity uh, consistent with lead. And when they did the spectroscopic examinations of the shroud, the vermilion would pop up, you know, like a firefly. You only need a scan. little. You don't, no, you don't need great lumps of it. They only found a tiny bit. Okay, but ti okay, tiny bits would still, uh, opaque is opaque. And let's just even get visually, na it, since you agree that it's naturally dried blood stains, and I think you were talking about how you thought that there was some vermilion touch-ups on well, the... Keep, yeah, something the to keep red. Okay, but if that's the case, naturally dried blood is anywhere from black to super dark brown, if you do a little vermilion touch-up, how, how is that going to show up up against dark black, brown or black? Well, if you look at the blood stains, they're practically worn away. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part. You said they're practically what? Worn oh, away. Oh, worn away, worn yes. Away. But we see it what? in the interstices. Yeah. But we didn't, we haven't looked at the interstices. Except by eye. Can't, well, from the fibers. You can't see. No, we didn't get any fibers from the interstices. The fibers come off the top. Yeah, but the fibers have the same material, presumably, right, as what's in between. Uh, yes, I expect so. So it, the natural assumption is that it's blood. You know, if it, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, yeah. it, 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 what's on the... Uh, What's on the fiber is bound to, and we have all of that mechanical abrasion. So, you know, we know that it's blood. It's got all the chemical components of blood. So if, if you had a bunch of vermilion on top, you're going to see it in the, uh, in the images that were taken. I don't, know how much, I don't know how much vermilion you need. Certainly the blood um, is opaque to... Um, what is it you can see? The uh, transmission light, transmission photographs that Barry took. But you can't see it on x-rays, I don't think. That's true. Hyperspectral uh, imaging would identify every blood mark, every piece of vermilion serum. You could look at all this stuff by hyperspectral imaging and identify these things. And all this, all this discussion, uh, pro or con, whatever, could, could be resolved. You're right. Hopefully it will be. It has been. That's no, it has. <laughs> All right. no, it has. It has not been. But now, uh, Hugh, how, how can you say that? Because for so many years... This will be your last uh, the last one, then we'll move on to the... I think the most important one is the, the image forming mechanism. So, yeah. Uh, go, if, go ahead, Teddy. Yeah. So, Hugh, given... In, in light of the fact that presumably you had the same uh, knowledge in terms of science and analytical powers and that you believed in the authenticity of the shroud for so many years, even after the carbon dating fiasco. Uh, how is it that all of it, you know, that you then change your mind 
based on your computations that uh, contamination can't account for the carbon dating. My understanding is that it was it was your own calculations that caused you to change your mind on the shroud's authenticity. That was that was the straw that broke the criminal's back rather than the single reason. Okay, uh, perfect. All right, so so let's. I think we've got a good sense of what we agree on versus where the the controversy is in terms of the the image features. So let's move to the final section. Okay, great. Well, now, what do we do with these facts? What does this mean in terms of how these images were were formed? And uh, so uh, last time it was Mark went first, and Hugh got the last word this time. So it's going to be flipped. Uh, Hugh, you get the first. Uh, first word on this section. So give us your, your opening speech and comments as to how do you think these images were formed? I think that we start with a life-size wooden bas-relief sculpture of Jesus in the tomb. So it's about four inches thick and essentially it's carved on the top and bottom surfaces. So cover the top surface with a substance. You lay the shroud on top of it. You peel it off. Turn the thing upside down. Cover the bottom surface with something. Lay the shroud on top of it. Peel it off. You then wash the shroud thoroughly, leaving only either of two things an acid degradation of the surface of the cloth or a dye on the for surfaces yeah oh, okay so yeah sorry i think the, the last little bit that you were saying got cut off right so so yeah Hugh, if you just want to like sort of repeat the, the last little bit that you said there so did you get the the substance on the bas relief you, you took a four-inch bastard leaf made out of wood, and then what did you do with it? You smear it, and with? you press the shroud on top of it. And what do you smear it with? You smear it with some kind of coloring agent, which is either contains an acid, which degrades the top layers of the shroud, or a dye which sinks into the top layers of the shroud. Either of them would do. You then wash it thoroughly, leaving only either the acid degraded carbo uh, hemicellulose or dyed hemicellulose. And that's about it. And just uh, one quick question before I turn it over to Mark to tell us about his image forming mechanism. Um, so you mentioned that vermilion was added to the blood stains and that gives them the pinkness. Uh, yeah. when, when was this? This was at a later date? Uh, like oh, five yeah, so Sorry, or was it the original artist who put that in? Oh, I don't know. I don't think it matters. It, it could have been later. Okay, cool. All right, so Mark, yeah, I'll turn it to you in, in 10 minutes or less. Okay, well, how do you explain the, the images on the Shroud of Turin? Well, I have a hypothesis um, that is caused by radiation from the body. And, but I don't want to just sit and argue about, you know, Hughes' hypothesis and my hypothesis and, and, and a dozen other hypotheses. I want to test them and see. Um, at one time back in the, I think the 1930s or so, um, uh, the guy who came the closest in his day to duplicating the Shroud's images was a guy, I think his name was Rodante. And he had a great idea about soaking the Shroud in uh, liquid allotene solutions, which is uh, mostly uh, aloes and myrrhs and things of that nature. And then uh, had a way of, you know, duplicating the image and it was actually better than Vignon's, who, who could only get a very poor hand image. But there's, there's the, the stirp, um, at least on the inside, 
uh, part of the shroud on the frontal dorsal image and on the background there's not there's not a, a, a lick of of allotine or myrrh or or aloes so we can talk about all these hypotheses you want but if if this wasn't what was on the shroud it's it's just interesting conversation but it's it's almost like talking about uh uh if if one team traded their star center fielder for a star pitcher what what it would be well it it's 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 all conjecture and it it, it but why don't um a good hypothesis uh test is tested and um like i said um Hughes Bastard Leaf is, is interesting, but um, if it's a naturalistic method or an artistic method or a combination, testing it out is, is going to give you more ideas, but better yet, testing the shroud and seeing if any of these materials or substances or processes or whatever signs, you could test all of these things, including the radiation or the Bastard Leaf or the, you know, the dye, the acid, and 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 there are other methods that that advocate these things, but let's test them and find out what's there, and and have it all done on the up and open, and and let the results speak for themselves. Because the the biblical accounts of the of the passion and the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection still stand, whether the the shroud corroborates it or not. But if the shroud does corroborate it then it's something everybody in the world needs to know about. And you don't have to believe it or anything like that, but you might be able to achieve, um, I can't think of a more important objective than life after death. You might be able to achieve that. And if, you, if you're not interested, that's fine. But it's something that's relevant because everybody's going to die. Now, it's still worth testing just a, a, you know, an artificial or naturalistic method. Let's see if there's corroborating evidence. And even if it's not, it'll still be interesting to see how in the heck those images and blood marks and things of all the unique qualities were put on the shroud, what its real age is, and all that kind of stuff. We have everything to gain, and I can't think of a thing we have to lose. I agree with you. Good. <laughs> I appreciate it. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So... I guess, you know, obviously I think we're all agreed that more testing is required and, and is beneficial. We, I think we all want the more data we get, the better kind of thing. Um, but just out of curiosity, then, in the meantime, with the, the data that we have, let's try to assess some of the, the hypotheses and see how they come up in, in a discussion part here. So, um, yeah, I guess, Hugh, Hugh you're, you're, we'll start by assessing uh, Mark's historically co consistent hypothesis there. So, you know, you're familiar with that. Um, what do you make of this hypothesis? What would you like to discuss with Mark that are issues for you with that? From a, an image influencing mechanism, we, it's very difficult to talk about uh, non-scientific radiation, but did the radiation go from the body to the shroud? outside the body, or did it only affect the shroud as the shroud fell through the body? I think I know your question. It was hard to hear the last part of it, but the part of the cloth, the, the parts of the cloth that are touching the body, like the nose, and the hands, um, the parts of the cloth that are closest to the body, are going to get more radiation than the parts that are farther away. But all parts of the cloth are going to receive some radiation. It's going to be in proportion to their original distance from the cloth. So some parts of the body is getting the radiation directly. Some parts of the cloth is getting the radiation directly from the body. And, they, and, and as it falls, this all occurs with, within less than a second, but as it falls through the hands or, or face and that, the, the parts that are closest are going to get a little bit more. Um, I, I don't know if that answered your question completely, but part of the cloth does fall into the radiation and receives it in that way. If, 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 the, part, if, if the shroud is touching, so we say, the nose, 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so it gets denser radiation than the bit which is, I don't know, uh, uh, some hollow of it, like the eyes, yeah? Okay. Now, I, I can follow that. But now I'm saying as the shroud descends, yeah? Yes. The bit that was on the nose is not going to get any more radiation because it's now inside the body. Whereas the bit that was in the hollows is going to get more radiation because it's still outside the body receiving the radiation. Is that right? Well, if, if, if just the superficial surfaces of the body, and this, this is one possibility, the superficial surfaces of the body is giving off the radiation, and maybe at the depth of, of the bones, say on the, on the hands or the spinal column, um, the nose would be getting a little bit more than it's going to fall a little bit down into the surface, and it's all going to happen in a in a split second. You've got a combination of, of gravity and 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 brevity occurring there. Um, it it it, it uh, and you have to understand that that like the nose area doesn't get more uh, it doesn't get more of a bre a depth of coloration it's still only on the top one or two fibers at the nose it's just it's laterally distributed in other words there's a greater number of fibers colored at the nose uh, than the eye and protons is what i'm arguing could have been the encoding mechanism it's it's the opposite of uh, neutrons they stop at the first surface they come to which would be the superficial fibers and and uniformly distribute their energy so wait but no wait but if they stop at the first, they're coming from the bones um yeah the radiation could be coming from the finger bones yes or the if spinal they, column if they stop on the surface of a cloth how do they make it through the flesh of the body the body's disappearing <laughs> And, and most of the flesh of the body, they do not, they do not go through. They, most of the cloth just falls. A little bit of a vacuum, but also just gravity. And, and, but they're not getting, um, if they were getting radiation all the way through the body, you'd have nothing but a big blur. Yeah. It has to be momentary. So once they've reached halfway down, the, the, it stops it's it's nowhere close to halfway down. It it probably doesn't go any more than than the bones on the fingers, if that. Okay. Some of some of that radiation from the bone could have been reaching the cloth. The cloth doesn't necessarily have to go through the bones. You just can't fine tune it all that okay. precisely, and you're never going to duplicate it in in a laboratory. And does the bottom of the cloth fall upwards in a similar way? There could be a vacuum where the, the part of the cloth, say at the man's loins, his lower back, does rise up because the body's disappearing and it could create a vacuum there. And I, I don't know this, but a lot of it, things that might be consistent with it, it could be collapsing from the outer surface toward the end, as if you had your hands and you were clapping vertically instead of sideways. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but um, it's just no, the surface effect that's seen on the frontal and dorsal image. Yeah. I mean, so once you've come up with one hypothesis, that it is collimated radiation from the bones, it has a lot of corollaries which must be automatically must follow, if you see what I mean. The, That's cloth, what I'm the, the cloth collapse hypothesis does not necessarily entail a vertical co vertically collimated radiation. It might, but, but John Jackson's original one, the radiation was isotropic as, as it occurs naturally in a 360 degree direction. Yeah. And Bob Rucker always says to me, no, no, it's got to be vertically collimated radiation. And I says, well, you could add that to my hypothesis if you want. 
I think it would only help things, but it doesn't necessarily have to have that, the vertical collimation. Well, if it's isotropic, it should mark the area in between the two images of the head, surely? Um, I think the cloth is about six inches from the head, and I don't think um, protons would travel that far. Certainly neutrons would. That's the image I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah. Do you mind if I just, uh, so something you, you mentioned that you're, you go for the cloth collapse hypothesis, and I think Bob Rucker has come out against that, didn't he, at a, at a conference, he kind of said there was issues with that. Do, do you yeah. know what I'm, uh, would you mind explaining well, what are those issues and why are they? We have a friendly debate about this all the time. Um, he thinks, <clears throat> and maybe I've changed his thinking, I don't know, but he thinks that as soon as the radiation is released and it goes up to the cloth, that's it. There's no more image. And I says, first of all, I, I think he misses the fact there is evidence of the cloth moving while the radiation is going on. And it's, it's, it's those things that I hinted at earlier about these distortions um, on the image. But I see movement and, and the cloth, it could be getting some radiation on the way up, but it could also be getting some radiation on the way down. And to me, it would just make it more vertically collimated or more three-dimensional because the three-dimensionality is seen by the number of lateral encoded fibers at a location. And as it's falling, it could be getting more. Um, it, it, um, but I, I think you might be able to do some computer simulation possibly and test both of them. But I think we need a whole lot more information from the shroud by hyperspectral imaging. If we were to do all, invest all that effort and, and, and don't have nearly the information about the encoded fibers that we could get from hyperspectral imaging, I think we'd be we, we'd just wasting a lot of time and effort when, when we could uh, help figure a, out a computer simulation with a lot more information. So I, I think image forming is something uh, to, to be done um, maybe toward the end. But if you could prove that, that radiation, just neutrons were, were given off from the body, that's a mir miraculous event. Um, but if neutrons are released, and that's if, um, there's a good chance that protons are released because they're all held together inside the nucleus of you know, there, there's all kinds of them inside the nucleus of, of most atoms. Okay. Uh, and one, another thing I'd like, uh, in terms of your, your image forming mechanism, that I'd like you and Hugh to get both your takes on this is, okay, well, what about the blood, the encoding of the blood stains? Uh, what, what does your theory postulate on that front? Well, this is the weakest point of my theory, and uh, it, it's, it's independent of the body image formation. But I hypothesize, I sure as heck haven't proved it, but I hypothesize if the, if the body can give off radi neutrons and disappear, well, the blood is made of the same, you know, chromosomes, DNA, things like that. Why could, if the body did that, that might explain a lot of features about the body. If it disappears, the cloth keeps falling, and whereas the body reappears outside the tomb, or certainly outside the shroud, why couldn't the cloth, why couldn't the blood reappear where it disappeared at? And as the cloth collapses, it reappears, and that explains um, the pristine quality of the blood marks and how they're embedded. It would also be consistent with the fact that blood is on the shroud, but obviously no, no body is there. And when Jesus is seen um, on Easter morning, there's, there's no blood on his face or his head or his hands or, or his feet, the, the visible portions that you would have seen on him. Now, I, I haven't proven this case, 
But that's my hypothesis, and it's the weakest point, but it's kind of like the historically consistent hypothesis phase two. Mm. Okay, you. Dale, you mind if I uh, yes, jump in a little bit? Yes. So, uh, Mark, in terms of the body forming mechanism, uh, I think we probably agree that it's got to be something that's super high energy and it's so brief that it doesn't distort the chemical composition of the blood or are you kind of saying that maybe something miraculous happened with the blood as well i wasn't clear on that um it's very low energy very very low energy uh, let me give you an example how low it is if radiation caused the um do you know what the conjugated carbonyls are it's the double bonded uh, oxygen and hydrogen uh, atoms uh, in cellulose, uh, I think hydrogen, oxygen, and uh, carbon are single bonded together. But something just on the outer rims of the superficial fibers, they've broken the single bonded atoms. And when that happens, oxygen and hydrogen like the double bond with each other and themselves, primarily themselves. Um, this is a very, very low, very refined uh, type of energy. It's not high at all. Um, what was the last part of your question? Uh, in terms of something that's not going to alter the chemical composition of the blood, uh, since I believe blood, when it's heated up, like in in the scorch marks, it turns into, what is it, iron oxide or some form of iron uh, burnt blood turns into. It's got to be a process that creates the image that doesn't disturb the chemical composition of the blood. Yeah. I, 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 I've I never thought it was anything other than low energy, and uh, Ronaldo got me to thinking that. And, of course, in, in Jackson's uh, hypothesis, it's low energy uh, UV light, um, you would see, possibly though, you would see just a ton of radioactive atoms inside the blood because the blood is so much richer in, in chemicals like calcium and chlorine and, and um, oxygen, or nitrogen, mm -hmm. nitrogen 14. But I don't think you would see any degradation. And uh, if someone could, would argue that the radiation would affect it, Possibly the disappearance protects it, but I think even if they don't disappear. Do you mean degradation of the cellulose or of the blood? Of the blood. Okay. They chemically changed it. Like I, I, I tell, you know, if the blood marks, and they could be, they could be on there naturally somehow. If they were on there naturally, I think you'd still see possibly even more um, radioactive uh, carbon-14 chlorine 36 or calcium 41 and and that's one thing you could test no i've seen uh, some hypotheses where they or a hypothesis where they talk about a super high burst of energy that is just for just a tiny fraction of a second that uh that may have created uh, the image, uh, that it was Fonte? just so fast. I'm sorry? Is that Fonti? Julia Fonti? No, uh, no. I don't remember who's Paolo. it was, but I saw something recently where they were talking about how they did an experiment at uh, uh, oh, one of the big, where the Dallas Cowboys Stadium uh, in Dallas and they turned on all the lights for a moment and they were saying how it would have to be like way, way more wattage, but for, for just a super uh, millisecond. Okay. Okay. Yep. I know. So we'll let Mark come back and then I want to turn it to Hugh to get his take about this blood. Oh, uh, Hugh, you said something about somebody's, uh, were, were you offering a high, a high energy method there? It was hard to hear. Paolo Di Lazzaro, the E N E A um, place in Italy, using his eczema laser. Yeah, he was using lasers for a different purpose. Yeah, um, yeah, Paolo Di Lazzaro. 
Um, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't address uh, um, Teddy's question. Uh, I, I I don't think it's. I think it's. I, I very strongly think it's very low. Energy. Very low. And very, very low. And and the other thing, just for all of us to keep in mind, is that whatever the image forming mechanism is, it also needs to achieve the. Uh, quality that the shroud has of having that three dimensionality under a VP8 image analyzer because yeah. just doing these little powder rubbings that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, achieve the qualities that the shroud has and, and then you have to deal with the superficiality of the image the uniformity Im of the image no cementation of the fibers in the sure. non-blood parts of the Wait, body image. So I want to, so, so Hugh, if you, if you don't mind, let, let what Teddy just made some good points, but let, let's leave that. Cause I just want to finish our assessment of, of, um, of, of marks, the blood stains, and then we'll turn and look at your hypothesis or whatever. So, you know, first of all, what, what do you make of phase two of his, his hypothesis about how the blood stains got in? Oh, I, I find that very, difficult to get hold of. Um, it seems to me that if the shroud through the blood or on top of it somehow, blood stains would have ended up on, on both surfaces. So, hang on, the hand wound would also appear on the dorsal image. I'm, I'm sorry? It's falling right down. I... I Something about the doors. You're saying something, the doors limit. If, if the blood stayed where it was, as the body disappeared, mm -hmm. the blood would fall onto the dorsal side of the shroud and stain that. I think the blood disappears um, about the same time the body does, simultaneously, if you will. And reappears as the cloth is moving you're right if if the body disappears and the blood doesn't disappear the blood's just going to fall by gravity to the floor of the bench uh, to the bottom side of the bench to the dorsal side yeah. of the cloth um yes no i think i think the, the only way i could explain it was the body and the blood disappears at the same time, but they reappear in two different places. Again, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm never going to prove that. It's a little speculative at the moment. Yeah. If I was a little younger than 70, I could prove it. But, but the fact that I'm 70, I'm never going to live that long. I'll give you okay. that. <laughs> okay. All right, perfect. So, so let's now let's shift focus to assessing Hughes' hypothesis and you know Teddy Teddy brought up some excellent excellent points there so I'll give it to you Mark what what did you make of Hughes' hypothesis that you you know some issues that you want to discuss with him well uh, uh, hyperspectral imaging could could detect whether there's um, whether the oxidation and dehydration or the conjugated comb conjugate conjugated carbonyls by his method and you could you could just do that separate and apart from where they can do an image and you could then compare it to the same type of readings that you get from the shroud and, and now no one knows how good hyperspectral images is going to be but i'm i'm recommending that we engage in this on control samples Whose, whose oxidation and dehydration has been produced in the two ways that he mentions, dye or acid. I think it's, it's very different. Diff, um, I think that's one of the, the um, criticisms of Garla Shelley is that his oxidation and dehydration is an acid form and um, maybe radiation or other methods, dyes or other methods, would produce a different type of oxidation, but we really don't know until we try those. But it may shed a, a great deal of light on these issues, and it may be dispositive. It could also look and see if there's if there's any more powder between the threads. Under you know, Garlic Shelley's method um, would entail a lot of original powder on the cloth. Um, it, it, things like that. It it could determine, but. 
um, the proof is in the pudding. Um, if, if you've got a method that you're going to think uh, acid or dye causes this type of oxidation, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. It's not impossible. It'd be a lot of work. But um, what's a, a, an untested hypothesis is just, it's like saying the Cardinals are going to win the pennant for the next 10 years. It's, it's just, you know, it's possible, but you're not going to know that. Until see me, I'm holding a piece of linen cloth stained on one side, which has been through two boil washes. It's only about four inches square, and uh, and it's a pale yellow. So I can achieve something similar. It looks like you got to start now. You got to get two full length images, you know with a lot yeah, right. of other features but it's a start and that's that you're to be congratulated for, for doing something oh thank you now, now hugh let, let me ask so you've done actual experiments and that sort of thing in in light of both mark and uh teddy's critiques uh you know and all of the various image features that we agree on like uniformity, superficiality, the three-dimensional aspects and the the four to the uh vertically map wrapping distortions and all of that how do your results compare to these image features you know which ones have you succeeded on do you think or which ones have you failed on and and that like so, where are you? so far it's easy to do each one independently so i can easily anybody can easily produce an image that turns out mysteriously negative that's that's simple it's quite easy to do one that appears three-dimensional. That's also simple. Do it, with a, do it with a paintbrush and a pencil. So that, 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 that fact. Hugh, Hugh, can you repeat yourself? I cannot. I can't hear that last sentence or two. I think he, yeah, he said that the three-dimensional was easy. It's the last I heard. Okay. You could do. You can do it with a pencil. So the problem is doing that with something that makes superficiality as well. And I can't, can you do that on linen? I, yeah, I can't combine those three things. You see what I mean? You can't get. I can, yeah. I can do negative with a pencil. I can do three dimensional with a pencil, but I've got to do it without pigment. And I've got to do it superficial. And the, the vertically mapped wrapping distortions, did you test for oh, that? I haven't even addressed that. But once I've got a, a bass relief, it's automatic. You, you just press it down and that's it. And what about uniformity? Well, this was, yeah, if you just use one color, that's what you get. The idea that, I mean, it, se it seems quite extraordinary that everyone goes, um, that there's only one color on the shroud or something. But if you get a pencil piece of paper, then where you put lots of pencil, it's darker than where you don't put much pencil. Okay. Pencil is either or dark. Okay. And and have you taken efforts? What about uh, the blood stains and how they relate to the body images and that sort of thing? Have you done anything with that at all? Or only to say that I, I, I think it's human blood with lemon juice or something to keep it runny, trickled on. Okay, yeah, Mark, Mark, so what do you, what do you think about what Hugh just said there? And um, uh, Hugh, when you're working with a pencil, are you working on paper or linen? Oh yeah, just paper. Well, <laughs> you're going to have to do it with linen. Oh, yes, eventually, I say, you've got to tie these things together. Any individual bit is easy to do. But then fitting them all together, that's the difficult bit. Yeah, and, and, and but do, yeah, well, okay. Um, I, would, I, would, I would work with linen, but I, I, I've got about 30-some features you, you've got to do. You know, things like uh, um, you've got to, uh, just, a, a, you know, the, the tensile fibers, uh, 
The colored ones have to be weaker, less strength. Um, you've, you've, you've got to lack two-dimensional directionality, and that may be hard with a pencil. Um, uh, you've got to have a, a uh, uh, lack of residue, and that's going to be hard to do with a pencil. There's, there's, there's yeah, but see that sort of thing. If you get a die and you put it on a model, and then you lay the sheet on the model, then you have no residue because it's a die, and you have no directionality because you're putting a sheet directly down on top of it. Well, you got a long way to go, but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's no doubt you can. There's you can do a few of these, but you certainly can't do them all and combine them on on linen. At least it hasn't been done. And again, the proof's in the pudding. Oh, it's coming. Just and, and, two years. And, well, um, this will keep you out of pool halls. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I, to to it's ask down. guys. It's lockdown. Uh, it's doing. Oh, sorry. What did you say here? Lockdown. It's perfect oh. for this sort of thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, I want to before I turn it over to Teddy, um, I want I want to ask you about two uh, possible image forming mechanisms, naturalistic ones, to see what you guys make of, of these options. Um, so the the first one is uh, Colin Berry. He's been doing a lot of experiments with his toastograph uh, hypothesis. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with you, Hugh. Um, what, what do you make of Colin Berry's hypothesis? Is there any merit to that? Do you think it's wrong-headed on your, in your opinion? Yeah. Essentially, his is very, the same as Roger's. It's, just, it's a Maillard reaction of one kind or another. And I, I, I think it's good. Okay. Uh, he could apply his method to a bass relief. At the moment, he's just done it on his own hand. What's that last part? He's done it on his hand, and I think there's distortion, or would be. But if he did it on a bass relief, it might work. Okay. Uh, and, and Mark, what do you, what do you make uh, of Colin Berry's um, hypothesis there? Uh, to be honest with you, I ha I have not uh, heard of that one. I'm somewhat familiar with uh, Ray Rogers' Maillard reaction. And I, I put it in the appendix of my 2015 book, um, but I, I um, um, as I recall, um, Ray Rogers makes a lot of assumptions and, and just starts at a point, you know, three or four stages down the road and, and doesn't take it to those first three or four stages. And even, even when he starts at a, at a later assumed stage, um, it still doesn't work. I, um, um, I've never been impressed with Ray Rogers' science. Um, okay, and uh, Hugh, just to, to get from you before we move on to the, the next uh, image for me, I wanted to ask you guys about, uh, so, so in terms of Colin Berry's results that you've seen, what do you think are the image features that he's, besides the image distortion issue, that, that he's really working on? Does he get superficiality, uniform, like I know he, he claims this, but is I don't, uh, got, I don't think he's got superficiality, but he certainly got the negative from the 3D. Okay, so he doesn't have superficiality, and he has 3D and negative. And I think he also has no particulates, because they all wash off. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, I'll just ask the last question before it goes to Teddy. I, I promise, Teddy, I know you're being patient there. Um, <laughs> So this is one that I really wanted to ask is it's one of Barry Schwartz and I think could have worked and it's, it's, it's presented in 2014 by Dan Spicer and E.T. Todd where it, it postulates a low energy electrostatic model in combination with something like the Mailer reaction, the cloning agent. Um, so yeah, I'll start with you, Mark. Are, are you familiar with Spicer's theory there and, and what do you make of that? Um, a little bit. Um, uh, Bob Rucker has one um, similar to that. He thinks that the, the protons and the electrons create an, uh, uh, some type of electrostatic effect. And um, well, I, I just don't know. And then they're just going to have to go with it and, and 
we'll have to see what the results are. I um I talk, there are other scientists uh, have talked about uh, protons and electrons working together in, in, in a good way and in a bad way. I talked to Art Lynn about this. Um, Art's now almost 88 and he's pretty much retired. Um, but um, he always said that the electrons, uh, when they hit the cloth, they would immediately run to the edge, the closest edge where they were. They, they would have, and they're so, I think they're like about one 1800th and about one eight one thousand eight hundred sixty third the size of a of a tiny subatomic proton or neutron um and and he's not big on the uh, on the combination of electrons with protons and he wasn't wild about uh fonty's uh work in that regard but that's about all i know i'm just kind of repeating what what art told me Fair enough. Hugh, Hugh uh, are you familiar with that, and, and what do you make of that hypothesis? Um, well, it's it's loosely related, I think, to Julia Fanti's coronal discharge hypothesis. So, it, it essentially, you you have to posit a miracle, and I think that any explanations of miracles are largely doomed to failure unless they can be made extremely consistent. And I don't think that the electric charge separation copes with the um, the vertical, what's it, the collimation of the image satisfactorily. Okay, so it doesn't do the the, the uh, vertically mapped wrapping distortions well enough in your your opinion. There. I don't think so. Gotcha. For his, yeah, his diagram's a bit weird. Perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ask that. So now, Teddy, I'm, I'm going to let you off the leash here. Um, now, now, Mark and Hugh, um, are, are you guys good? Because I keep restricting Teddy based on the trying to aim for the three hour mark. But are you guys pressed for time or like do you have a time limit? I should cut it off for, for Teddy's cross examination. Um, yeah. Okay, Teddy, uh, the full full gambit. You can you can ask anything and everything and it doesn't even have to be from this section anything that you missed out because i i had to cut off the time you, you can go back and ask that it, it's your show okay. <laughs> so um one of the things when we're talking about the image forming mechanism all of the evidence that we have points to uh, there had to be blood first image second so, Hugh, when you were talking about the vast relief as the way to create the image, exactly how would that work? How are you getting the blood to where its blood clot exudates instead of just liquid blood? How, how is that going to work without smearing them? And... Uh, especially since it seems like they're, they found uh, Ed, Adrian Vanderhoven was talking about the acid, uh, the acidity of the blood, and that, that it was, you know, uh, indicative of a post mortem that the body, you know, was dead at the time that the transfer was made. Uh, and so how, how do you accomplish, you know, let's just get with the blood, the blood clot exudates, because it's not liquid blood on there. Uh, well, that rather depends, doesn't it? Um, on, when you say it's not liquid blood on there, we've got at least two places on the elbow and the heel where the blood is dribbled onto the shroud away from the body. Well, that yes, that that is true. The post mortem blood when they removed the uh, heel, there there was the dribble, yes. But but most of the, almost all of the uh, blood images are blood clot exudates, right? I love this blood exudate. If you actually try and invent some sort of way in which dried blood can suddenly produce an exudate. You yes, the hard. term's fibrinolysis, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, fibrinolysis doesn't happen outside the body. 
it's an enzymatic um, operation. Well, it, it happens with, with blood. Then, then why are all these scientists saying that that's how it would transfer? Do they have uh, no uh, clue? Hardly any scientists uh, say that. Fibrinolysis doesn't happen. No, that's not. Blood. <laughs> Enzyme is denatured. You know, it was a desperate attempt by Alan Adler to try and account. I think it's more than uh, Alan Adler that is going with um, with that in terms of how it transferred. And I think there's the possibility of, of either moisture, too, that could have... Yeah. If you get dried blood and you make it wet, you get little particles of blood floating about in the moisture. You don't get fibrinolysis. Once the enzymes are denatured, they don't renature by making them wet. Well, I mean, they, they're not going to renature, as you say, in terms of becoming liquid blood again, because that's not most of the, the, the blood stains are not liquid blood, because then you would have the capillarity uh, of liquid blood on the linen where it travels across the, the linen fibers, but we don't see that. We see something that was a dried blood clot that some that remoistened it goes, somewhat. It goes all the way. Yeah, it's definitely wet. The, the, there's a little bit of capillarity um, in the blood marks, and they need a, 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 a much more um, broader set of information from, from the shroud. Uh, this was uh, just based upon some tiny fibers that Stirp brought back with him in 78. But I don't think it's very extensive. I agree with you. Obviously, it flows through to the back of the shroud. So that's capillarity. Well, they don't know if it flows through or not. They, they really don't know. They just well, I mean, see it on the, on, the, on the outer side, but they've never really taken anything from the middle. But, I mean, you could have that with a blood clot where it's going to go all the way through, but because of the nature of it being a blood clot, it's not liquid to where you're going to see it just flowing all through the, the fibers. Like if you just drop one drop of blood onto a piece of linen, you're going to see it create like a star. That one drop of blood is going to create a star shape as it travels down those linen threads. Um, but that's not, but that's not really what we are seeing on the shroud. And so I kind of think that in terms of y'all were talking about how, when the shroud fell off the body, why do we not see that blood from the front part transfer over to the dorsal image? And I think that the reason why is because at that point on the third day, all the blood was dry, so you're not going to have, it's not wet still, so it's not going to seep through to the other side. Also, you have, even if it were wet, you have a body in between the front and the back part of the cloth, so when it drops, uh, there's no reason to think that even if it were wet, that the front and the back part of the cloth are going to to smear and, and to make contact with one another. But, um, but anyway, so, but, so Hugh, like when you're talking about the bass relief, uh, you're talking about some unknown stain or dye. At the moment, well, at the moment I'm working with iron acetate, which is made by putting white wool vinegar. I'm sorry, by putting what? Wire wool, iron wool, uh -huh. in vinegar. Okay. And you get a dark brown solution of iron acetate. Mm -hmm. When you paint that on it, it doesn't go through. It's only superficial. And when you wash it, it stays there. Okay, but there's no evidence of, from what I recall, there's no evidence of iron acetate. There are three different forms of iron on the shroud. You wash it which, in, you uh, 
Well, just, I don't know that iron acetate is dissolvable in toluene because if it was, then how? If it were, why? How did the uh, did the Sterp team discover all of the three different forms of iron oxide that Macron never bothered to distinguish between? They didn't discover any iron oxide chemically. Oh yes, they did. What, what did you say? You said that they didn't. Where they, they postulated. No, they, they found vermilion on the shroud. They found it, a bit of vermilion, didn't they? Yeah. And, and the iron oxide was absolutely, they found three different forms of iron. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the critiques of, um, of Macron was that he uh, was not distinguishing between it. There was the heme-bound iron in the blood, the cellulose bound chelated iron that was found uniformly across the entire shroud that was part of the redding process. And then the iron oxide, uh, the particular, the particulates, and then they found a bunch in the water stain that I think, uh, they think were, uh, moved around from when the shroud was in the fire and they doused it. Yeah, there seems to have been quite a lot of iron in that water stain. Right. But, uh, and then, of course, from the, uh, the shroud paintings that were sanctified on the, uh, on the authentic shroud, which you have uh, bits of contact transfer from, the, from actual paintings. Yeah, that's a guess, isn't it? No, it's not a guess. There were what fifty-two uh, authentic, uh, where it's documented. Fifty-two uh, fake shrouds were uh, made into second-class relics by being touched up against the real shroud. Fifty-two. Yes, Painting. that's what I read. Paintings. They would yes. lay a painting over the cloth. What were they painted in? They were painted in things like vermilion. That's why you've got all that vermilion and things like iron oxide, which is no, no, why no, you've no. got those particulates. You're guessing. They, they even found guessing. Some, some from the ceiling of the castle that they were in that would just flake off. Yes. Just bits and pieces. Because vermilion is notorious for flaking off, as um, Isabel Pixek uh, has, has done played. her own experiment. Yeah, you're inventing the vermilion. I'm not inventing it. But, they but found it. Mean, Sterp found vermilion, so did Macron. But you've got to demonstrate that it's not fixing. Uh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, I just wanted to interrupt because I wanted to get, I don't know if you guys covered this about the iron oxide. So Teddy and you were having a debate about uh, the uniform, like iron oxide is, is claimed to be uniform. Um, among the shroud, and, and he was saying, well, actually, that's not... Hard. No, no, the cellulose-bound chelated iron, not the iron oxide. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so, have you guys already addressed that? Yeah, Mark, I was wondering, like, what did you, what do you make of Hugh's claim on that front? Uh, what was your, what was Hugh's claim? Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, Hugh. What, well, what what's claim was now? Well, uh, well I, I'm saying that if there was, that Morris London's discovery that the um, iron oxide on the shroud matched the intensity of the air. No, that, that does not. I don't know what uh, Motern found, but uh, numerous studies show no correlation between the image and the iron oxide, any of the three forms. Uh, and most of the iron that uh, Dale was talking about and, and Teddy was talking about is from the redding process, and it's all over the cloth. And and the another type you were talking about was at the edges of the water stains, where when uh, picture you know the the shrouds just out of a, a hot environment from the fire of 1532, and you throw a bucket of water over the the reliquary, the water line is going to bring some chemicals with it, and it's going to deposit it at the edges where you see the stains more similar, more, more familiarly uh, at the edges, and it'll bring some chemicals with him, and you'll see a correlation like that, but there's no correlation between iron and vermilion with the image, and... Um, Look at Morris and London's paper. Well, you may get a limited uh, statement to that effect, but, 
but uh, you'll see many more papers that come to a different conclusion. Scientists, and that's what they discovered. Well, um, it's uh, you're cherry picking, and um, there well, I, I I can't you know I'd have to get up and go look at my articles, but uh, there there really is no correlation between the iron oxide and the body images. Uh, I I don't think that's demonstrated by by the shroud uh, scientists themselves, by the stirp scientists themselves. Well, we'll go to uh, Adler and Heller's uh, chemical investigation paper, and it's discussed numerous times, and go to the ACS paper, where I think you have uh, five or six uh, stirp scientists discussing that, and then go to uh, Rogers and Schwalbe's paper, where it's discussed, again, I know of those three papers, places but um, and then go to Morris and London who actually report what they found um and what do you say they found that they did a, a spectrographic analysis from the blood outwards to the hair where they found that the proportion of iron oxide matches the intensity of the image well the implication there is that it's a painting but where is the binder to bind the paint I remember that little picture with that little uh, skinny rectangle, and and some of that blood could be from the hair too. Some of the the iron oxide could be from the blood in the hair. It could be from all sorts of things, but I'm just saying uh, exactly. That's exactly my point. But it does that, correlate with the image. Well, yes, but you can take one thing that that's not focused on that. And, and it's, 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 it's just one line. And yeah, if you pick up some blood with it too, you could attribute to that. But it, you, you're prematurely attributing it to a painting. And, and the, the other studies don't indicate that is all I can tell you. Hugh, well, if, are, you, are they insinuating that it's watercolor as uh, Walter McCrone claimed? Because of course, watercolor is soluble in water and it would have been washed away during the dousing of parts of the shroud body image with water during yeah. the fire. He, he was putting a conclusion on there about a painting. They just notice a little correlation in a little tiny strip and they don't attribute it to a painting. No, no, they don't know. No, but you are. Uh, well, uh, no, I'm simply saying it's one of the little pieces of evidence. Right, but if if you're if, going to if if you're going to use that to point to this is made by human hands, uh, you know that it's a painting of sorts or some sort of creation, you have to meet up with a number a vast number of other components of of different properties that the shroud exhibits. Yeah. which a bass relief isn't. I mean, I don't know how you're going to get the uniformity of the image, the superficiality of the image oh, we, with the we, bass we, relief. Not to mention... I can get uniformity and superficiality very easily. You can give me up to one to two uh, fibrils? Yes, of course. You can do and it yourself. And how did you do that, where it's uniform and also superficial? Well, you just get a fiber tip pen, a hanky. I, I'm sorry, you're fading out. I couldn't hear you. Just get a what? A fiber tipped pen and scribble on a handkerchief and see what you get. Okay, well, I, I don't have a fiber tip pen. What, will a highlighter work? Probably. <laughs> just draw a line on a piece of white cloth. And it's only going to go one to two fibrils deep in the thread. And, and how do you create a frontal and dorsal life-size body image where all of that remains uh, uniform, where all of the threads are largely the same color, where you don't have some that are a little bit darker, others that are a little bit lighter? If you only use one color pigment, you're only going to get one color. Yes, on the but for example, I'm I'm a bit of an amateur artist, and I I've used I've done a lot of work with chalk pastels. You yep. can use the same pastel, yet in certain areas the hand is going to go a little bit heavier, in other areas the hand is going to go lighter. It's not going to be, and that's just on a a small uh, 
drawing, much less a life-size figure. But the shroud is darker in places and lighter in other places. Ah, but the each spot where it is darker, yeah. the thread there is not any darker from pressure. It's just that you have a greater accumulation of color in right. that area. That's, so that's, that's totally different. It, no, it's not. It, well, sure it is. Because if I'm doing it by hand and there are darker areas, it's that there's more pigment coming down, like from from pressure, meaning that there's not a a uniformity in the application process. Yeah, in your case, though, when you're using it, when you're using a um, a fiber tip pen or a pastel, the lack of uniformity is caused by the amount of pigment. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, is by the amount of what? The amount of pigment compared to the amount of cloth. The, the lack of uniformity comes from the pressure put down. Yeah, but when, when, you, when you, lift, you lift it up, if it looks dark, it's because there's a lot of pigment there. And if it looks light, it's because there isn't much pigment there. Well, but you can also, for example, the pointillists. They could create an image area looking darker by putting a whole bunch of dots tight in a tightly compressed area where it gives the illusion of darkness. Whereas if they space out those dots, it makes it look paler from a distance. That's, that's, so that's, it, that's exactly it. Even though the dots are the same color, well, that's, that's how the shroud is. It's what? made substances of the same color. Now, it might not be pigment. I'm, I'm losing you a little bit. You said it's substances where it's all the same colored pigment. The, pi the pigment is all the same color. Yes, I agree. And the color of the shroud is all the same color. What did you say? The color of the shroud? Is all the same color. Right, but we have the... Uh, when we look at it, we see some areas are darker than others just because of cloth-to-body distance. No, 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 no. No, that is the case. Not necessarily. Well, it's, well what's another explanation? Necessarily. What, what, no, what makes, I mean, you, you explained it yourself. You said that you could make things darker by putting more pressure on them. So if I put a fast relief and I press a cloth on it, I'm going to get more discoloration, whatever the cause, I'm going to get more discoloration on the top surfaces than on the lower surfaces. But then you're going to have more pigment. So oh, if, it's it's a, pigment. if it's a dye, then I'm going to wash all the pigment off. And the dye will produce the same effect as on the shroud. Okay, so here is something. When we talk about a dye leaving some color, I have not checked this out with the scientists, but there is just no way that what I'm about to say can't. It's got to be true. If one sees a stain, let's just take, you know, laundry, grass stain or whatever on uh, a piece of cloth and you wash it with detergents, stain removers, it comes out and you see and the stain has not been completely removed. Now, Ooh. I would submit uh, that if you can still see part of that stain with the, with the naked eye or even microscopically, then that means that some of the chemical of whatever produced the stain is still present. It's just like in, uh, in criminal cases, somebody washes down uh, certain things from blood, yet, you know, you can still uh, sometimes find through UV light and things, evidence of it, that there's still uh, a chemical imprint. But if, but with the stain, if, if, if yep. whatever you were claiming is creating this body image, yeah. if we still see the image from the dye, then the evidence of the dye has to still, I would submit, still be in 
or on that cloth. Yeah, I agree with you. But we don't see evidence of a dye that is comprising the body image. And there, and then, and then you also have with the VPA image well, analyzer, wait a minute. where to that we don't see evidence of the dye. If the body image is caused by dye, then we certainly see evidence of the dye. What you're saying is Heller and Adler didn't find the dye after they rinsed the fibers with a liquid that dissolved dye. But they also see a degradation of the cellulose, so that cannot just yeah. be accounted for by the dye. They, they yeah. keep yeah. Yeah. looking at it. And remember, they looked at it microscopically before they ever put toluene and xylene onto it. Uh, and they did scans. And, and their scans reflected, uh, I guess it's the refractive index, the back of the background of the shroud cloth is consistent uh, with yellow matter dye, but now, that's not what's comprising the image. Now, Teddy, I'll let I'll let you come back to that the question you're asking. Um, I have a couple of questions for myself, but I just so I know, are you do you have anything to probe Mark on specifically as well? I didn't have any questions that came up uh i guess most of my questions tend to revolve around how how huge a, a, a method of creating the shroud by human hands gotcha. is just so far you know i i won't say anything's impossible but i i absolutely delight at at everyone trying to do all of these experiments on the shroud because uh, when when you have all of these great minds doing their very best to disprove the shroud's authenticity and then they fail to uh, replicate the shroud with all of its um, very, very complex properties, that just further furthers the argument that the shroud was not made by human hands. So I'm telling all these scientists, knock yourself out. And uh, yeah, don't, don't you get the point about this, the difficulty with reverse engineering recipes? Okay, but okay, you mentioned that before with the whole reverse engineering business. Uh, I can reverse engineer the properties of a painting uh, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be exactly the same painting in order to uh, use and have my painting reflect the same property. So if I use my linseed oil and and uh, my different colored uh, oil paints and things like that, I can. Uh, for example, I, I I dabble a little bit with oil paints. I I've got my flake white paint that can approximate uh, or, or actually have the properties that a Renoir has. No, my painting's not going to look like a Renoir, but I can um, use the same things that he does. And I how, can do, how, do you, how, can, how can you tell that you can use the same pigments as Renoir used? Well, first of all, the way that you have these specialists Yes. Uh, and scientists like Macron who disprove forgeries um, that are being. How do you how do we know what pigments Renoir used? Well, they do, they can they can analyze all of the materials that are on a painting, and that's one of the ways that fake fake paintings of masterpieces are spotted by. By noticing that, oh, wait a minute, they're using titanium white when yeah. titanium white wasn't around uh, yeah. when this master was painting. So supposing all they did with the Renoir was take a few fibers, rinse them thoroughly in toluene, would they then be able to get a good idea as to what pigments he... Let, 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 seriously, there's, there's a statement you keep making and they tried every oxidant, reductant, acids, bases, all kinds of things to remove the body image color from the shroud. And they weren't successful until they used an agent called thymol, T-H-Y-M-O-L. 
And for what it's worth, it took it off immediately. Um, I corresponded with uh, Ronaldo uh, in France, and um, he said his um, particle irradiated straw yellow color fibers acted the same way. It was resistant to all his acids and bases, but as soon as he put thymol on it, it, it went away immediately. So don't say they, they took all the color off for that. They did not. They kept trying to on certain fibers to take the color off. And, and finally, they, they found it with thymol. And, th and that brings to mind the other aspect of the shout. If this is a dye or uh, acid, then how is it that the body image was able to be flaked off, that it was so superficial that they could just flake it off. You wouldn't have that with the dye. The no, dye just, would, would be seeped into the fibril, assuming that it, they were able to get it that superficial to where it didn't flow through the whole uh, thread. Okay, so let, let's let Hugh have the last word on that, and then I want to ask him about something you mentioned about three-dimensional things for his image for me, just to, to give people something. So, yeah, he, Hugh, how do you respond to what Teddy think, just... Teddy's confusing the stuff that flakes off and the stuff that doesn't flake off. The, um, what, whatever was colored was the primary cell wall of the flax fibers. So, and that's the thing, that's the thing that was degraded, and that's the thing that lost its color when treated with thymol. Now, that stuff, that peeled off. So it, it wasn't the color itself. Wait a minute. I thought that when they flaked off the body image, it was then the background image color underneath what was being flaked off. Yeah, you were left. If the primary cell wall, which carried the color, came off, then you're left with the secondary cell wall, which is uncolored. But how do you achieve that with the dye? If the dye is in the primary cell wall, then the primary cell wall comes off. Well, have, have you or any other scientist managed to create an image, especially one co as complex as two life-size images where just the primary cell wall has been depicted that can just be flaked off? Uh, no, we're okay. working okay, on it. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's stop this. Um, okay, great. We, I think we've, we've made our points on this issue, but... Just, just as a couple quick questions, let's focus on the three dimension, three dimensionality for a second. And I want, I want Hugh and, and Mark's opinion on this because Hugh was saying that, well, hey, my method can't achieve three dimensional uh, results. And, you know, similar to Garlo Shelley's by by using a simple bas relief. Um, but there have been experts have studied this, and they say that actually it doesn't get you. It only gets you partial three dimensionality. In, some people have said it, it only gets you flat plateaus, which are contact zones, uh, versus valleys, which are known as non-contact zones. So you get these steep cliffs. It doesn't give you the fine gradations of, of three-dimensionality. So, yeah, I just wanted to get uh, both of your guys' take on that. What, what do you yep. think of, of Yeah, Hugh, go ahead. Since, since it's my hypothesis, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea. So if you imagine a woodcut, we start with a woodcut. Mm -hmm. A woodcut is, is a flat piece of wood, and you carve away the bits that you don't colored. Yeah? So they have sharp edges and troughs in between them. If you then spread your paint over the top of the wood, you press a piece of paint on it with uniform pressure, then all the paint on the surface is at the same level, you get the same picture, you get the same kind of color. Now, if you use a best relief, then you've got graduations of slope and differences of depth. And that in a and press down on it, then some bits will be pressed with a greater press than others, giving you different a different amount of color 
which gives you a, uh, the, bas the, the um, three dimensional aspect of it. And just if you actually look at the famous VP8 picture, it looks like a bas relief, like a whole body. It's okay. flat. Okay, uh, Mark, I'll, I'll let you come back. You, you've been sort of listening there. I, I, I don't, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And if, if you've got a way to do this, to, to do all the features on the shroud, the superficiality, the three-dimensionality, the, the fact that the material's not even on there anymore and you've got degraded uh, cellulose uh, with conjugated carbonyls and they're in a three-dimensional correlation of, of distance, well, go ahead and show it to us. But talking theory, I should sit here and join in and say, oh, no, the, the blood marks disappear and reappear, and it's, it's all theory. And yeah, um, that's what you do. This talk is about theory. how it could theoretically happen, but I'd, I'd like to see you produce it. And, and until then, it's just the theory. And, um, and you who focus a lot of your effort on historical uh, practices and that, I mean, this kind of practice is never seen in any age before. And, and the, these attempts to, to make it a three-dimensional image and oxidize the hydrated cellulose and all that, or, or are you talking about the uh, fluorescence around the blood marks and that, these things wouldn't be known until the 20th century. And to think a medieval forger would think all this stuff up is pretty darn absurd. It's, it's less absurd no, 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 that's not fair. Well, uh, no, it's less absurd than, than, than if a resurrection occurred, because at least, at least there's historical um, accounts of that and, and extensive accounts of that. So I, I don't know. I mean, you're, you're saying, well, you could do it or something like that, but, but you're, you're placing this in, the, in, in medieval times, and yeah. somebody, it's, it, if you're arguing naturalistic or artistic, it's still a, a, the odds of that are is is going to the moon by flapping my arms. No, nope, I think I'm going to get there. Well, and you got to do it on the unprimed linen too, which uh, makes it extremely difficult. And uh, and one of the criticisms that I have read about trying to do an image uh, by way of the bas relief method is that as you are pressing the linen into the crevices, like with the fingers and stuff, once you pull the linen out, you have distorted the fibers of the linen and it's not going to sit right and give you that flat, beautiful appearance that is so realistic that forensic pathologists as well as anatomists they, uh, they all, I mean, almost all, I'm sure you can always find somebody that'll say whatever, but uh, they all find it to be um, amazingly convincing to where they have done sort of mock autopsies on life-size photographs of the shroud, and they're all amazed, for example, that the blood flow flows precisely as that type of blood flow would come from where the wounds are. So you've got the venous type blood flows, you've got arterial type blood flows, the blood flow that is, uh, you've got pre and post-mortem blood flows. And they all say um, that the blood is flowing, it always follows gravity and it flows the way they expect it to flow. You even have once uh, the body, clearly it's a crucifixion victim, uh, once he was removed from the cross, you have, when they took the, the nail wounds out of the leg, out of the feet, you can see that it then moves in a different direction than the blood flows from when the person was hanging on the cross and the way it followed gravity. And so, I can't even decide how many nails that were in the feet, let alone all the beds were in the feet. Oh, I, hold on, I can't, I can't hear at all what you're saying. It came very... Uh, they can't up. even decide how many nails there were, let alone the direction of the blood. Then you can tell the flow, even though you don't know how many nails it were, you can still see how the flow goes. 
Well, that ought, if it comes from somewhere, that ought to tell you where the nail holes were. Well, it, there's different theories, but your, your, your statement that you can't tell the flows, you can tell the flows independent of the nails. You, you may not know, you may not have the nails, but you can still see on the, on the picture which direction they're going. Are you talking about whether or not each foot was nailed or whether it was just one nail for both feet? Is that what you're referring to, Hugh? There, there are about four different ideas. And I, I'm, I'm just saying that all these experts are, in fact, they come to uh, different conclusions. Right, but regardless of how many nails, of the, of the nail holes that we see, uh, the way the blood is flowing is, is so well, realistic. I, I mean, there you have experts, forensic pathologists you like Zugaby and Buckland, yep. looking at these, and they are just amazed at how realistic it all looks. And so yep. we're going to have some some medieval guy that thinks, yep. oh, and let me put <laughs> serum rings around everything too to boot. So can we see? So we've got say two buttons. Yeah. I, I, let's let's let this be the last last. I, I think. We should okay. Know. Bucklin yeah. agreed with Barbe that the evidence, as is an expert um, forensic pathologist that he was, in uh, was he in Los Angeles? Yeah, he was. In, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also uh, Houston. He, uh, he agreed, Barbe that the nail went through the space of Desto and damaged the median nerve. The blood on the shroud was so accurate that he could pinpoint exactly where the nail went in. Is that right? Well, it didn't go in the space of Destot. That's on the opposite side. That, I mean, Barbe did make a mistake sorry. with that. Oh, wait a minute. So all your experts, they can't make up their own minds. Well, you, did, you did two people who believed actually contradictory things, and you believe them both. We don't. All we all we need to prove is that person. I mean, because all we see with the nail wound on the wrist is we're seeing an exit wound. So we don't know if the person was nailed through the wrist, which we do know uh, for a fact that a person uh, can be nailed through the wrist, and that that and the particular area that they can go through the wrist, not the space of Destot. No, uh, no, 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 don't believe this because experts have told you. And well, now experts it's out. always the only, agree the only everywhere. The only difference is Zugabi says it's it's the wrist area. He moves it over maybe, maybe a quarter of an inch from Barbe. And I talked to him about that. And I says, gosh, you're making a mountain out of a molehill here. And he goes, yeah, I know. But, I mean, it's <laughs> not that it's not that dispositive. If you want to move it over a quarter of an inch, go ahead. It's still. I it, don't mind. You, you, I could agree with you. You can move it all over the place. But don't then say that the image is so precise that an expert can tell exactly where it is. Because, obviously, they can be a quarter of an inch out. No, Nobody was just said the blood marks are realistic and they flow from the wrist area instead of the space of desktop. But she wasn't putting all her cards on the space of desktop. Not none of my cards on the space of desktop. I mean, it, Wait a it minute. could it's have been the what? upper palm uh, you or could, the wrist. You. You, said, you said all these forensic scientists and you mentioned Buckland. And now you're telling me we don't have to pay any attention to Buckland because he was wrong. No, I didn't. No, that. she never I said didn't that. Say that. I didn't say that at all. I said, I said that wasn't. they were talking about the realistic nature of the wounds and the blood flow and that there were pre-mortem wounds, uh, yeah, yeah. pre-mortem blood flows, post-mortem blood flows. You're basing uh, this on on, a, on the evidence of some expert. Oh, I think you... it was something like 20 forensic pathologists, something like that, a huge number of yeah. people that had nothing to do with the Sturt team Absolutely. who have looked at life-size photographs yep. of the Shroud of Turin They're and like... are amazed at the realistic nature of it. And then you look at medieval artwork and um, and so and that somebody just for some I think you had mentioned like for some Easter play yep. that they're going to go through 
all of this trouble where all of these people all across the world are, are just trying so hard to show that the shroud is a fake and they're trying their best, just like you are, to replicate it and they all fail. And the reason why they fail is because it's not made by human hands. And to try to uh, to say that it's a painting, you, where's the where's the binder? There is no binder on there. And then paints back then were made, were they they were insoluble to water. So, uh, you know, and as we had talked about during our debate where Macron was talking uh, or trying to allege that it was just a bunch of watermarks in the abdomen area and that that washed away the image. And uh, Dr. Lavoy countered back and said during their debate together, he said, no, those are calcium rings. And when you look at them close up, what you see underneath is, boom, the image is still there even though water hit it. So Walter McCrone's cockamamie idea of this being a watercolor is it, it's cockamamie. That's that's what it is. And, and you know, yeah, he was capable of a lot of things and he was well known for a good reason, but sometimes people when they make a mistake, they just double down on that and they don't you know, admit when they made an error. And he made an error in making the assumption that because he saw bits of iron oxide on on the shroud, he made an error assuming that the whole thing was a painting. When had he waited, had he examined things a little bit better, and had he taken those uh, specimens off of the sticky tape where it wouldn't have messed up the refractive index, he would have come to the conclusion that the STERP team did. Okay, so, all right, great. So I think we're going to end it at, at this point. Um, it was a great conversation. I hope all sides involved feel like they, they got to have their fair fair say uh, on their end. Um, yeah, he, hopefully you had a good time, Hugh. I know that uh, it was three against one, and so <laughs> you were a good sport there. Still right. <laughs> awesome. And uh, Mark, hopefully you had a good time on your end as well. Uh, yes. Excellent. Okay. okay. All right. So I just want to say thanks again to, to everyone, and uh, I hope the audience enjoys this and found it informative. Um, and next week, uh, I do have Dr. Dale Tuggy has agreed to to come on and debate me. He's a Unita Unitarian Christian, so we're going to be discussing the philosophical case for Trinitarianism versus Unitarianism. And uh, yeah, I think every, hope uh, everyone has a good week. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Well, thank you so much for having us. You're welcome. Bye-bye, Dale.